Okay, since it's uh, 9 a.m., uh, let, let us begin now. Um, I hope I'm audible. Yes, okay, thank you. So hello everyone and welcome. Uh, I am Mahima Dugal, an Associated Research Fellow at the Institute for Security and Development Policy, or ISDP. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to this rather exciting event on renewable energy and climate cooperation, a case for Sweden and Japan. The symposium is organized by ISDP South Asia and Indo-Pacific Center in coordination with Japan's Kajima Institute of International Peace, or KIIP, as a part of their first joint study on climate change. We are particularly excited to hold this event so soon after the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26 in Glasgow, earlier this month. Climate change is an issue that transcends national boundaries and demands international cooperation. A focus on renewable energy like solar, wind, nuclear, and geothermal is critical to enable sustainable development and a green transition. Japan and Sweden are both leaders in the climate change domain. While Sweden has long been at the forefront of environmental issues in Europe, Japan has also accelerated its efforts with former Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga setting ambitious goals that will pave the way for other countries in Asia. This focus on climate change is now being taken forward by Prime Minister Fumio Kishida with his pledge to contribute $10 billion to assist Asia in achieving zero carbon emissions. Essentially, increase Japan-Sweden climate cooperation to exchange ideas, technologies, and best practices can help advance deeper Asia-Europe transcontinental cooperation on the issue. Accordingly, ISTP and KIIP's climate change study, which began with an inaugural session in June of this year, looks to cement such a Sweden-Japan link through a multi-year project subject to approval by both sides, of course. The project aims to further explore opportunities for collaboration between the two countries on the matter of climate action. And for this, we hold regular online lectures, panel discussions, and closed door meetings with experts and policymakers. This is our first symposium, and depending on the pandemic situation, we hope to hold a physical in-person conference in Stockholm next year. This symposium will take place over two days with six sessions. Today, we have three sessions covering topics like renewable energy and the need for international cooperation, the state of rene renewable energy in Sweden, and lastly, renewable energy co uh, cooperation, green growth, and the private sector. These sessions will be chaired by Professor Maria Peterson of the Lulea University of Technology, uh, Tatsuo Shikata Sensei, Associate Researcher with KIIP and a fellow at Mitsui, and of course, ISDP's very own distinguished fellow and head of the Japan Center, Ambassador Lars Wago. We are also very pleased to have ISDP Director Nicholas Swanstrom and KIIP President Nobuyuki Hiraizumi Sensei join us today. Because this event is uh, come so close to COP26, we are especially proud to have secured such prominent experts to present in quite a short time. We are proud to, proud to present an outstanding lineup of speakers and discussants representing institutions like the Uppsala University, Swedish Bioenergy Association, Stockholm Environment Institute, the Lulea University of Technology, the Malardelen University, the University of Adelaide, the University of Lund, Gemini Strategy Group, uh, Belt and Road Initiative Sri Lanka, the Observer Research Foundation Center for Resources Management, the Manipal Academy of Higher Education, and the Strategica Group Asia Pacific. Thank you especially to our speakers uh, from North America. We know it is a very different time zone for you, so thank you for agreeing to present today. So we have a wide range of speakers from Asia and Europe and across the world, which we are sure will make for a truly engaging and productive discussion. Without further ado, I will hand over the session to Ambassador Wago to steer us through inaugural session and session one. Thank you and over to you, Ambassador Wago. Thank you very much. And again, welcome to this joint seminar uh, on the important topic of climate change. Uh, let me first uh, introduce Dr. Nika Swanström, who is the head of the uh, ISTP, the Institute for Security and Development Policy, who will uh, give us a few uh, opening remarks. To be followed later by the pre president of the KIIP, the 
uh, distinguished uh, Ms. President uh, Hiraizumi Nobuyuki, who will uh, also give um, a welcome uh, opening remark. So please go ahead, Dr. Swanstrom. Well, thank you so much. And uh, well, good in the middle of the night. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we represent all the time zones there. But welcome to this virtual symposium, Renewable Energy and Climate Cooperation, uh, with a focus on Sweden and Japan. And this symposium is a joint endeavor between uh, Kajima Institute for International Peace in Tokyo and ISDP here in Stockholm. And it's, as was mentioned, it's a part of a larger project that we hope to expand into something very useful. But first, let me thank all the team members of ISDP and KIP for arranging this symposium and, ad and addressing a pressing and crucial relevant issue that is facing all of us. And, um, and as a student of this team, I'm actually looking extremely much forward to this. And as my old professor Ashok will also have a, I think an extremely interesting presentation. But especially I would like to thank President, uh, President Hirai Sumisan for taking this effort to engage with ISDP. And, we're extremely thankful for this cooperation and, and a bit of others. I would begin by saying that this imposes some extremely long time since it's happening just after the Glasgow COP26. And I think we need much more of these symposiums and events to generate more practical and ground level understanding between countries. And then particularly between countries in Europe and Asia. Um, I think there's a lot of commonality and I think we see with the same eyes on many of the problem. And I think that a partnership between Sweden and Japan can actually lead this to a large extent. And I think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned, both for Sweden and Japan from each other's uh, progresses, but also mistakes. I mean, I think we have to be honest that we, we haven't been all that successful in dealing with, with, with climate and why it's so essential that we engage and bring in all these absolutely fantastic experts we have uh, during these two days. And I would argue that climate change is an imminent human and environmental security concern. Uh, maybe one of the most important we're actually facing and uh, also something that I think the international community should be able to find a common view on. And, um, and I think that we can be much more effective. You have more brainstorming and research cooperation and try to deliberate up on, deliberate up on ideas that will have a long-term policy impact. So again, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank and welcome all the speakers. Um, and, um, and I would have to say that through your engagement, I think you, you are doing a fantastic job to facilitate a better and more sustainable world for our future generations. And um, today, a focus on renewable energy is seen as a vital comp component in the transition to green economies, sustainable development, and poverty eradication. It's not only a valuable addition to, the, to a country's economy, but it's also crucial for universal energy access, energy security, and curb the impact of climate cooperation. The renewable energy can also be used in most energy sectors from transport and industry to power production and thermal use. Therefore, I think an integrated approach towards efficient renewable energy is fundamental. But I think it also is important to point out that this is not without problems. And I think Professor Schwein will come up and actually talk a bit about this challenges we're facing in what is potentially seen as something very easy and accessible, um, water and, and, and uh, sort of uh, conflict around that. And, um, and so even if Sweden is a leader in global environment, ranking eighth on the um, Global Environmental Performance Index, um, Japan has been recognized as a leader in Asia when it comes to climate change. Uh, I think there still is a lot we need to do and we can work together. And in, in this regard, cooperation with governments, multilateral institutions and private sector is fundamental in driving this tran transformation towards green economies in Asia and Europe. 
Um, and I think that as a layman on the, the climate change matter, I mean, I have just sort of outlined a few very simplified uh, things. And I believe it to the expert in this symposium to have a more concrete discussion and pro propose concrete measures how to forge a better understanding of renewable energy and climate change. Um, with this in mind, I will, I once again welcome all the speakers, participants, and discuss something in this symposium. And I look forward to a very interactive and fruitful discussion over the next couple of days. Hopefully, the discussion can put forward ideas on insights on uh, forming a long-term partnership for climate change, uh, climate action, acknowledging the significance of just and sustainable transition to a lower carbon and climate resilient environment. And with that, I will hand over to uh, Ambassador Lars Stark again. So thank you very much and very much welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it is now my pleasure to turn the mic over to Mr. Hiraizumi. You have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Where am I? Okay. okay. Um, I thought that the uh, if there's two people assigned for you know opening remarks, the remarks would be similar. So in order for me to differentiate, I uh, put up this. You know, call me crazy, but I put up this PowerPoint. Um, I want to accomplish two things in my opening remark, remarks. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, I wish to express my genuine gratitude to uh, Dr. Swanstrom and the ISDP for inviting KIP to jointly host this event. Um, and in order to show my appreciation, I wear a Swedish collar, golden blue tie, and uh, Swedish hockey jersey for the occasion. So um, having said that, uh, okay, um, can you turn the page please? Okay, let me introduce um, KIIP to you. The KIIP was established 55 years ago uh, in 1966 by my grandfather, who is photographed on the left, left hand up top corner. Um, the bee spectacle guy with a you know shy smile. Uh, that's my grandfather, and uh, he was an ex diplomat from German School of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Uh, and at that point in time, in 1966, he was a House of a, a member of the House of Councillors, um, and he was also a chairperson of Kajima. Then. Uh, one of the largest construction company like Skanska uh, in Japan. Um, 1966, we were experiencing, we were at the height of the Cold War um, in East Asia before Nixon's you know, sudden visit to Beijing and before detente between Brezhnev and Nixon. Um, Vietnam War was raging, B-52 bombers were bombing Hanoi from US Marine Base in Okinawa. Um, at that time, you know, Okinawa was still occupied by, you know, USA. Against this backdrop, um, there were no wonder uh, that my grandfather was afraid that Japan may be dragged into yet another war. So he established KIP to ex execute research and propose policies and make those policies into law. Uh, upon his death in 1982, the KIAP was succeeded by his son-in-law, Wataru Hiraizumi, my father, who was photographed on the top right-hand corner. Um, and, uh, uh, well, he, he also was an dip ex-diplomat from French School of Ministry of Fine, uh, Foreign Affairs in Japan and was a member of the House of Representatives. Uh, he was a one-time Minister of Science and Technology, a one-time Minister of Economic Planning. Uh, six years ago, he passed away after ruling over the institution for 30 years or so. 
Um, I was appointed to manage the KIP as a sort of a custodian president on the strength of 20 year experience in assisting my father running the show. Um, I wish to take advantage of the fact that I lack, you know, neither diplomatic uh, nor political background and focus uh, on challenging controversial policy uh, and taking risks that publicly funded institutions cannot afford. Um, and, you know, let, let's see my strat how my strategy will pan out. Uh, can you turn over to the next page? Okay. And the second point I wish to make is that uh, where Japan will be going regarding climate change. Uh, this is my sort of a, uh, my prediction for the upcoming years, as far as Japan goes. Uh, Japan has been lagging behind in climate change. And, uh, you know, uh, we were sort of a laughing stop at COP25, COP26, so on and so forth. But I think Japan has all of a sudden met with this, what Japanese call within ourselves, a black ship which is a change agent, uh, which will radically transform the way Japanese corporation, which occupies you know, a large proportion of Japanese economy, um, um, it changes behavior. I think Japan will change within a decade because of the establishment of the International Sustainability Standards Board on November 3rd, 2021. Uh, well, Japan is, I believe that Japan is not a creator civilization nor, uh, you know, standard setter. Rather, it's an excellent adapter and arranger of original to its likings. Um, I think I, I already spoke in five minutes or so, so I will elaborate on this message on the closing remarks. Uh, so I, uh, you know, uh, I end my you know, remarks uh, at this point. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, this is an international conference, you can say, and not surprisingly, we're already lagging behind when it comes to time. <laughs> so, uh, it is my great pleasure to um, hand over the, uh, the microphone to Professor Ashok Swain or Swain. He's the professor and head of Department of Peace and Conflict Research at Uppsala University and also a UNESCO chair of uh, International Water Corporation. He will uh, speak uh, on the topic of hydropower, renewable energy with a cost. So please, uh, the, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Um, it's my honor to speak at this symposium today. Um, what I'll say is not new or revolutionary or what something to keep in mind discussing planning and making policies on renewable energy and climate change uh, during the symposium and afterwards. Uh, I, I mean, I will speak mostly on the hydropower uh, and the hydropower, both uh, Sweden and uh, Japan have been quite uh, leaders in, in this field, both at home as well as financing up outside. So I think it's important to know what comes with it. Uh, are we really contributing to the climate change or how this climate change is being uh, you know, mitigated or affected by our policies? So that's, that's, why, that's what I will discuss. Uh, as we know, energy and human well-beings and progress are closely connected anywhere we live. Energy provisions is a critical component of increased social and economic development. Besides our regular dependence on domestic use, agriculture, manufacturing, transportation, constructions, health, social services, all, all depend on access to energy. The crucial role of energy in societal and economic development often gets highlighted in international forums. With it, the importance of access to sustainable modern energy services in helping to eradicate poverty, save lives, improve health, and provide basic human needs. There is a significant correlation between an adequate, inadequate supply of energy and economic underdevelopment. So we need to know that it's estimated that nearly 1 billion people, approximately one in eight globally, still lack access to electricity. 
and almost all of them live in developing countries. About 3 billion people rely on solid fuels, such as wood, coal, and charcoal for subsistence. The population growth, urbanization, and increasing demand for more food, goods, and services have put further challenges to the energy supplies and energy structure, which is presently dominated by fossil fuels. Thus, access to electricity must be environmentally, economically, and socially sustainable. At the same time, the geopolitics on energy has undergone a significant transformation in recent decades due to new discoveries, changing power equation, and changing climate. The globalization of energy trade has also added further challenge to regional and national energy security. Growing domestic energy demand due to increasing population and growing economy on the one hand, and the international obligation due to urgency of climate change demand countries to follow the path to sustainable energy future. The need of the hour is to invest and prioritize using renewable energy resources to achieve sustainable energy security. This will have an immense potential benefit and create a more cooperative, rule-based society and reduce poverty and rising human development. In many respects, smart and energy policy will play a pivotal role in shaping a brighter future. As energy is the driver for development, sustainable energy is the stimulus for sustainable development. The importance of sustainable energy has been emphasized by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 7. The distinguished feature of renewable energy is that it's inexhaustible and thus a critical part of sustainable development. Among the renewable energy energy sources, hydroelectric power is the only renewable energy most likely to be used for large scale production to achieve environmental, social and economic development. The World Summit on Sustainable Development in way back in 2002 had explicitly specified that hydropower should be promoted and developed as a stimulus to increase the share and use of energy, renewable energy worldwide. Hydropower is shown to have a broader scale range of electrical output and much higher efficiency, 80 to 90%, compared to other renewable energy resources. Thus, it can play a strategic role in energy transition and renewable energy promotion. Besides that, hydropower can effectively store energy and is a less climate dependent and less unpredictable than other renewable energy resources such as biomass, solar, and wind power. Therefore, with climate change already threatening the survival of this planet, hydropower is being given priority by many countries to develop for the sake of national energy security. The multi-service provided, multi-services provided by the hydropower development and its technical advantage could be driving force for local, regional, and national development, a catalyst for sustainable development and climate change mitigation. Water has been providing energy for centuries, and hydropower was one of the earliest form of energy used to run factories. Hydropower constitutes the largest source of renewable electricity, 17% of the global power produced in 2020 itself with 1,330 gigawatt capacity, almost three times of wind power and six times of the solar. The amount of hydropower produced in 2020 is roughly the same as the annual electricity consumption in the US. China is already far ahead in hydropower production with 356 gigawatt, followed by Brazil, US, Canada, India, Norway, and Japan. Sweden produces 16 gigawatt hydropower annually, almost half of Norway's. In the, I just wanted to mention it's a half of Norway. That's a, uh, only the Swedes will understand the meaning of it. Uh, in the last two decades, uh, hydropower generation worldwide has increased almost 70% and is estimated to increase another 50% in the next two decades. At present, there are 1,000 dams under constructions, mainly in Asia and Africa. The massive dam building is taking place in China, India, Turkey, and Ethiopia. The ambition of achieving net zero emission by 2050 can only be achieved with expanding renewable energy production. 
phasing out or phasing down coal is intricately dependent upon the generation of renewable energy, mainly hydropower. Without hydropower, countries are very likely to lack flexibility and clean storage to address increasing variation on renewable energy production. International Hydropower Association says that more than 500 gigawatt of hydropower projects are being constructed or planned worldwide. However, in a limiting global warming below two degrees centigrade, models prepared by the International Energy Association, International Energy Agency and International Renewable Energy Agency ask for hydropower productions to reach 850 gigawatt by 2050. So we are at, at least 350 less. If the ambition goes to remains to limit to 1.5 1 1 degree centigrade, then the hydropower needs will reach 1,200 gigawatts by 2050. Many countries are looking to build more hydropower dams to meet their climate commitment made in the, made in the Paris Agreement. The cost of hydropower is still less than electricity production from solar and wind, though the gap is closing fast. Despite the common impression about hydropower being quote unquote good energy, people usually forget that the primary hydropower sources are large dams and the storage reservoirs. Hydropower emissions are usually overlooked, but the inundation of large forest areas in the reservoirs result in removing forest cover and vegetation fermentation underwater also produces methane and bioorganic carbon. Dams are also colossal construction projects and building dam itself causes enormous pollution locally with the use of cement, steels, and rocks. The hydropower industry has been often criticized for overlooking the in indigenous people's rights and labor laws. Sweden's 45% of electricity generation comes from hydropower. Even in Sweden, 80% of large hydropower dams are located in traditional Sami lands. Uh, yesterday, there was a big uh, news that uh, you know, the Swedish church has uh, apologized to the Sami, this is our indigenous people here, uh, for the crimes committed or the uh, uh, things were committed in the 17th, 18th century. But I think at present, also the Sami lands are being used heavily for the hydropower productions here. Moreover, as for a conservative estimate, 80 million people have been displaced worldwide by dam projects, 80 million. That's a conservative estimate. More than a decade ago, I brought out a study that at least 20 million people have been displaced in India alone due to dam constructions that used to be called mod temples of modern India. Only 2 million people had received some sort of uh, compensation out of 20 million. Over and above, the dams are too costly to be built, particularly by the poor developing countries, take too long to build and cause major conflict between groups and between countries. I'm not going into the conflict part, which will be much, uh, which Nicholas mentioned in the beginning, but I'm not getting in there. That will take a long period of time to discuss. Uh, suppose we must build large dams for hydropower. In that case, it's critical to building them suitably and sustainably to minimize different types of environmental and social costs and maximize their benefit. The World Commission on Dams since 2000 has suggested a policy framework to achieve sustainability of large dams according to the universally agreed five values, equity, sustainability, efficiency, participatory decision-making and accountability. And all these are applicable to all the renewable energy production energy projects where we, we will be uh, undertaking or we will have to undertake. Replacing the traditional top-down and technology-focused way of building dams, World Commission Dam has asked for a constructive and innovative way for decision-making with seven strategic priorities and corresponding policy principles. The seven strategic priorities are gaining public acceptance, two, comprehensive option assessment, three, addressing existing dams, four, sustaining rivers and livelihoods, five, recognizing entitlements and sharing benefits, six, ensuring compliances, seven, sharing rivers for peace, development, and security. If I do, do I have a minute to go into this or you want me to finish it, uh, Ambassador? Yeah, 
Uh, please go ahead and, and use that minute efficiently. efficiently. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> gaining public acceptance for the dam project means all the interested groups are informed about the issues at stake, their entitlements are safeguarded, and their rights are recognized. Before deciding to build a large dam, the full range of political, institutional, and technical options concerning alternatives to dams are needed to be comprehensively assessed in a participatory process. The management and the maintenance of existing dams should be continuously assessed and enhanced to maximize the benefits and minimize the social and environmental damages. It's vital to protect and restore the ecosystem in the river basin, which could be greatly transformed by the large dams to mitigate and limit the harm to the health and integrity of the river system and those livelihoods dependent upon it. Based on identifying rights and evaluating risks, a joint negotiations with unfavorably affected people is required to redress the balance, resulting in mutually agreed and legally enforceable mitigation and development provisions. These provisions need to recognize entitlements that improve livelihoods and quality of life. Successful mitigation, resettlement, and developments are all fundamental commitments and responsibilities of the state and the developer. To win and maintain public trust and confidence, governments, developers, regulators, and operators must meet all the commitments made to the people while pursuing the policy of dam building or any energy renewable energy projects. Conflicts and considerable tensions over transboundary river will appear if there is a power imbalance among riparian countries concerning specific intervention for diverting water. Therefore, storage, Diversions of water resources require mutual self-interest for regional cooperation and constructive, peaceful cooperation in the whole river basin, what we see now in the Blue Nile Basin quite a big way. While we talk here about the dams also applies to other renewable energy projects as well. Finally, I want to reiterate that we need renewable energy to keep the planet safe from devastating climate change. Hydropower is an important component in the world's strategy to move away from fossil fuel-based energy production. However, it's a fact that hydropower doesn't come free of cost. It has a price to pay, and the world should do everything to minimize that cost and maximize its benefit. Thank you, and I wish you my best for interesting and fruitful discussions during the two days of this symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Swain, for a very important keynote speech. Uh, we will now move to session one, which is titled Renewable Energy and the Need for International Cooperation. And I have the pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Jeremy Maxey, uh, who's, a, who's an associate at the Strategica Group Asia Pacific, and he will speak on the topic, the geopolitics of renewable energy and transatl uh, transatlantic relations. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I, I first want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate in this symposium. And since we're behind schedule, I'm going to launch straight into my presentation. I'm going to put my uh, leave my slides up while I'm speaking so that it's easier for everyone to follow and so that it's easier for me to stay on point and stay focused in, uh, during the discussion. So can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay. All right, so uh, I'll be speaking on the geopolitics and geoeconomics of renewable energy and transatlantic and trilateral relations in a changing world. So, this is a roadmap of what we'll be discussing, uh, stru structure, change, and uncertainty in the global order, US-China strategic rivalry, which I argue is systemic, global, and protracted, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, transformations in energy, technology, and war. We'll discuss the three Cs, critical materials, critical, te critical technologies, and critical supply chains, and then I'll end offer a few general policy recommendations based on this strategic foresight, and then we'll end with a few uh, key takeaways. And we'll have maybe two minutes for each topic. So I think we can all agree that the international order, uh, as we understand it, is evolving and that we 
have shifted or are shifting from a unipolar to a multipolar order. The uncertainty or disagreement, of course, is over what kind of multipolar order and where we are in the transition. And I would offer for our discussion here today to expect disruptive and nonlinear transformation of the global order over the next 20 to 30 years. And I think that's a relevant time frame in the context of the energy transition and climate mitigation. Now, of course, multiple scenarios are possible, but I want to emphasize that multipolarity does not mean more multilateralism or independence and globalization and many of the character, main characteristics that we associate with the international liberal order. Uh, I anticipate that in an increasingly multipolar world, we're likely to see an increase and intensification of systemic and structural uh, competition. And that systemic rivalry and and, and competition will tran potentially transform the global order and which will in turn affect the change the domestic political economy of states within this international system and potentially change the relationships between the state society and markets within the individual countries and i think it's also to uh, at least consider that the multipolar order itself may be transitional and it may emerge into a new unipolar or bipolar order over the long-term horizon. Now, of course, the drivers of change is the creative destruction of the international liberal order. It's the long-term redistribution of wealth and power between and within, the country, within countries, and this change has been created by the order itself. Other drivers or characteristics of this change is great power rivalry, revisionist state behavior, and nationalist and populist responses on both the left and the right to globalization. We see an increase in economic nationalism and protectionism, as well as authoritarianism and also illiberalism in certain democracies. And then we have emerging and disruptive technologies, and of course, the pandemic and climate change which are, which are all driving this change. Now, I want to say that the international liberal order is not sacrosanct. And what I mean by that is that the key architects and the stakeholders that have created and shaped this order may decide that in the face of such tr transformation, that they need to improvise and shape a new order rather than simply trying to double down and revitalize and restore the international liberal order. And what does all of this mean for our purposes here today? It provides the structural context in which renewable energy and climate cooperation occurs. So what type of order you have will shape and determine what sort of cooperation you have. So for US strategic rivalry, I argue that that is systemic in nature. It's increasingly global in scale and it's likely to be protracted in duration. Now, I make a couple of assumptions, and these assumptions can all be challenged. So China is a revisionist power that seeks to establish some form of hegemony or hierarchy in Asia, in which the United States role is peripheral and regional states are differential and accommodating. It also seeks to shape the international order in alignment with its interests and preferences to the fullest extent possible. The U.S. is a status quo power that seeks to maintain its global position through domestic strengthening and leading a counterbalancing coalition against China, which it perceives as a systemic rival and pacing threat. There is, as you know, a broad bipartisan consensus on this issue. Now, I would argue here that the U.S. is not necessarily a declining power and that I would focus on the system. I think the international liberal order is in decline, not necessarily the member states. That includes all our allies and partners in the transatlantic relationship and our allies and partners in Asia and elsewhere. Now, beyond this geopolitical and security competition that we see in Asia and the Indo-Pacific, the other struggle is over the commanding heights of the global economy and also global governance, the institutions, the laws, the norms, and leadership and legitimacy. So the question becomes, who will write the rules of the new order? 
which system will shape and dominate the emerging global order and possibly restructure global capitalism as we understand it? Will it be some form of democratic capitalism or will it be the logic of authoritarian state capitalism? What this means for our purposes is that transatlantic and trilateral cooperation on renewable energy and climate change risk being subsumed into this broader strategic rivalry for wealth, power, influence, legitimacy, and global leadership. Now, the fourth industrial revolution, the anticipated transformations in energy tech and war. I've provided a basic definition of what of the fourth industrial revolution and listed uh, some of the main technologies that we associate with that, and there are many others. But for our purposes, it's important to understand that renew the renewable energy transition, the technology revolution, and the transformation of war all intersect along the lines of what we can call the three C's, critical materials, critical, te critical technologies, and critical supply chains. These sit at the commanding heights of the global economy and are the focus of great power rivalry. And many of these three C's have dual use applications. So what this means for renewable energy and climate change policies is that they are not just about climate mitigation and environmental sustainability, but they are industrial policies and they are geoeconomic geo strategies that are very difficult to compartmentalize and delink from this broader strategic rivalry and great power politics that we are observing. Now, a few more words on the three C's. It's important in the context that China's revisionist behavior and economic coercion, along with the pandemic, have exposed dependencies, vulnerabilities, and the risk in global supply chains that were overlooked in previous decades. China has a leading or dominant position across several renewable energy value chains, such as the extraction and processing of rare earth minerals, as well as lithium batteries, solar, wind, and electric vehicles. China also seeks a leading or dominant position in several emerging and disruptive technologies, including artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biotechnology, and the list goes on. Now, many of these critical materials and advanced technologies have dual use applications and they're widely perceived by most states as vital to their national security and national defense, as well as their national economic security and economic competitiveness. So with all of this being said, what does it mean going forward and what sort of strategies and policies should we design? And I would argue based on what I've said that we should in terms of transatlantic and trilateral cooperation, we should focus on the three C's. And we should try to coordinate with each other and with like-minded countries to reduce these strategic dependencies and vulnerabilities, to manage risk and uncertainty, and to promote collaborative research and development with the private sector. And I think in this context of global transformation, that the most effective way to do this is through flexible, and adaptive networks via ad hoc and overlapping bilateral and multilateral arrangements that are problem driven, sector specific, or regionally focused, rather than broad uh, multilateral approaches such as the G20 or the COP26. Those tend to become slow and uh, ineffective. It also means a selective and partial decoupling. And I wanna emphasize the word selective and partial because we understand that a complete decoupling is not really possible or advisable. But the point of this is to restructure and build secure, resilient and trusted supply chains, as well as revitalize industrial bases and innovative technology system in our respective countries among allies and partners. Now, of course, the challenge is going to be aligning all these various industrial policies and geoeconomic strategies over the long term. And by that, I mean at least the next 20 or 30 years. The problem is policy continuity. From the top down, the global shifts in relative power, great power rivalry, and revisionist state behavior will drive the transatlantic trilateral cooperation with like minded countries. From the bottom up, nationalism and populism on the left and the right in response to globalization along with state level concerns over their economic security, their sovereignty and autonomy 
will of course limit the scope and duration of what is politically possible. And above all, perhaps the greatest challenge is preventing the fragmentation of the global economy in the emergence or regional bounded orders. Now, this last point is, of course, we'd like to think a low probability scenario, but it's something that we need to consider. So to wrap up quickly, because we're short on time, uh, some key takeaways. First and foremost, we should anticipate disruptive and nonlinear transformation of the global order over the next 20 to 30 years. In other words, do not assume a business as usual scenario. The next 20 to 30 years may not look like the past 20 or 30. And US-China strategic rivalry is systemic, global and protracted. And the fundamental question is which system will dominate and shape the global order and restructure global capitalism as we understand it. And because of this, tri transatlantic and trilateral cooperation on renewable energy and climate change risk being subsumed into this broader strategic rivalry for wealth, power, influence, legitimacy, and global leadership over the emerging order. Renewable energy and climate policies are fundamentally industrial policies and geoeconomic strategies, and they're difficult to compartmentalize and delink from this broader strategic rivalry and great power politics. As a result, I recommend close transatlantic and trilateral cooperation and coordination with like-minded countries to reduce strategic dependencies and vulnerabilities and manage risk and uncertainty. We should focus on the three C's, critical materials, critical technologies, and critical supply chains. And I think the best way to do this in the scenario that I've articulated is through flexible and adaptive networks of like-minded countries operating through ad hoc and overlapping bilateral, minilateral arrangements that are problem driven, sector specific or regionally focused. Now I moved through that pretty quick uh, because we're short on time. So that, I'll, that concludes my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Thank you, Mr. Maxi. Uh, although uh, you um, kept it short, uh, it was very, very interesting. And I'm sure there, there are many um, questions and comments. And I hope that we have some time for, for that towards the end of the session. Uh, but I'd like to move on uh, to the next speaker, uh, who is, uh, again, excuse me if I pronounce your name uh, wrongly, Professor Danashri Jayaram, who is the assistant professor at the Manipal Academy of Higher Education. The professor will speak on uh, the European Union's climate cooperation with the Indo-Pacific and the geopolitics of renewable energy. So please go ahead, Professor. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, you pronounced my name absolutely right, so there's no problem with that. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to the organizers uh, for uh, for inviting me uh, to this particular symposium, which sounds very interesting. Um, so since there is a lack of time, and I, I, I will try and finish it within the time frame given to me. Um, and thankfully, uh, uh, Mr. Maxi has already given a really good geopolitical and geoeconomic context uh, uh, to the renewable energy uh, aspects, so I, you know, that pretty much uh, covers some, uh, you know, some part of the presentation that I wanted to make. Uh, I don't have a presentation. I will be uh, uh, speaking. Uh, so uh, since uh, Jeremy spoke mostly about the global context, uh, what I will be focusing on is uh, the the newly emerged geopolitical construct of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, with which, uh, you know, even uh, 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 regional organizations such as the European Union seems to be engaging much more than before. And it's uh, this year that uh, the EU has released its uh, uh, official Indo-Pacific strategy as well, which has come after a few countries within the EU already releasing uh, their own uh, independent uh, strategies as well, uh, which are now being linked with the EU strategy. Uh, so, what does this mean for EU's uh, uh, climate cooperation with the countries of the Indo-Pacific region, as well as regional organizations and various other uh, frameworks and architectures that are now uh, operational in this region, which is uh, which is something that is uh, you know a hot kind of uh, topic because uh, especially after China's BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, was launched. There's been a lot of uh, lot of activity around alternatives to BRI. So this includes uh, like uh, Japan, India, 
uh, uh, program on Asia, Africa growth corridor, there's Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific, there's USA Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, there is also India's security and growth for all in the region. Uh, you know, with all these different strategies in place, which are all meant to, in some sort of ways, uh, uh, meant to be alternatives to China's Belt and Road Initiative. What does it mean for renewable energy? What does it mean for climate cooperation of the EU with this region? This is what I'm primarily going to talk about. So the way I'm going, uh, the way I have structured my talk is to first talk about EU's strategy itself and where does green transition, renewable energy, and all these aspects really feature in the document. And beyond that, what are the challenges and options available for the EU uh, going forward? Uh, as we talked about. And of course, I will also be uh, referring to Sweden, Japan, and various other countries which are very uh, pivotal to this uh, climate cooperation aspect. Uh, so the EU's uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, in fact, mentions very clearly sustainable development goals, the uh, achievement of Paris Agreement goals, including the net zero target, which the UN has uh, set, so that is 2050. It also mentions uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, which is also one of the uh, biggest uh, challenges that we face in terms of biodiversity, uh, 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 you know, deforestation, uh, extinction of species and other problems. Um, it also talks about, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, deepening engagement with various partners. So as, as, we, as I mentioned, uh, various countries within the EU already have pre-established, uh, uh, you know, bilateral relations with various countries that are also uh, relations uh, which have been deepened over a period of time with regional organizations such as ASEAN uh, uh, and to some extent uh, BIMSTEC and SARC, but uh, not to the extent, say, with ASEAN, for instance. There is also this newly emerged construct called the Quad, the informal arrangement, which has also uh, formed the working group on climate change, which is also trying to now promote uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation measures in the region. Now, these are all new some of these are pretty new and we have to see where it goes, but these all provide opportunities for the EU as well, which as mentioned in the strategy also, that these are the ways in which EU can deepen its engagement on climate change with the region. What are the seven priority areas uh, mentioned in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, strategy? So the sustainable and inclusive prosperity, green transition, ocean governance, digital governance and partnerships, connectivity, security and defense and human security. Now, if you look at all these different areas have, you know, direct, indirect, various kinds of connections with renewable energy itself. Uh, you know, so green transition is just one part, whether you look at ocean governance, which also has a lot of potential in terms of, uh, uh, you know, offshore wind energy and other aspects. There's also digital governance, which is something that is very critical to, say, this concept of super grids and other, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, um, infrastructures that we are talking about. Uh, you talk about the military, again, there is you know, constant conversations that are going around about how the military can reduce its carbon footprint or it can uh, uh, engage in green innovation. And then lastly, but not uh, uh, last, but not the least, human security. And as was mentioned in the, in the first session, I think it's very important to also link these issues up with security as well. And now security, not in the traditional sense, but how does it affect uh, uh, livelihoods, how does it affect food, water, and various other issues. And as we know, energy is something that is interlinked with so many other issues as well, uh, uh, you know, as, uh, as, in the, uh, as also mentioned by Professor, Professor Swain uh, about how, you know, uh, socioeconomic development and all these issues are interconnected with each other. So we need to look at it in a more holistic manner. Um, now, uh, what are the other things mentioned uh, in the strategy? You have, you know, resilient, diversified, uh, uh, you know, uh, value uh, value supply chains, for instance. Uh, uh, and one of the things that the EU is uh, talking about today is about the environmental due diligence. Uh, what does it mean for, say, uh, this whole supply chain uh, discussions across the Indo-Pacific? Because this is going to affect how uh, uh, the uh, the supply chains are going to be restructured to make sure that they are in consonance with environmental regulations, greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, uh, re regulations, and others. Uh, there is also a question of how do you really, uh, how do you really uh, promote resilience of, say, energy systems in countries with various vulnerabilities uh, and developmental requirements. Now, this is important because Indo-Pacific is a very diverse region. Now, this, uh, this region uh, consists of countries with varied developmental levels, uh, different climate vulnerabilities, 
different socioeconomic contexts, including you know, gender and other kinds of issues which are embedded in the way we need to respond to energy transitions as well. So it's very important that resilience concept is something that needs to be also uh, integrated into the climate cooperation of the EU with uh, the larger construct of Indo-Pacific uh, and you know all the other so-called multilateral, minilateral uh, frameworks that are being built, or as well as the uh, you know bilateral sort of uh, frameworks as well. Uh, one uh, aspect which is highlighted in the strategy is that of green alliances and partnerships. Now this is very important, especially in the backdrop of the COP26, which was recently held. It's very clear that so many coalitions and alliances have been uh, have been knitted together now, including uh, you know powering past coal, uh, renewable energy alliances. You have international solar alliance, whole lot of alliances which need to be strengthened. So yes, multilateral partnerships already exist. Now, how do you uh, make sure that, uh, you know, the EU can really, uh, 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 I mean, it, it, the EU needs to kind of, uh, uh, the EU needs to kind of, you know, uh, uh, capitalize on these existing multilateral partnerships as well. In fact, uh, the EU uh, or has already agreed with Japan on the so-called Green Alliance in May 2021. This is the first one that the EU has signed. Um, there is also sustainable finance, which is very important. Now, when it comes to sustainable finance, uh, what what does it mean for many countries in the region? We also have to look at just transitions because there are quite a few uh, coal dependent economies. There are quite a few uh, uh, quite a few communities which are still not ready for that transformation that we keep talking about. So uh, you know, transition to transformation, that quick jump is something that needs to also reflect upon the existing geopolitics, not from just the classical geopolitical perspective, but also from the critical geopolitical perspective. And as I already mentioned, in this uh, respect, EU has already started engaging with some of the regional organizations like ASEAN in a much deeper way, providing finance, providing finance for just transitions and other, other sort of uh, arrangements. The other area where the EU definitely has scope and it is already uh, kind of engaged in is about educational and research exchanges uh, through like projects like Horizon Europe and before that Horizon 2020. This has also provided enough scope for cooperation. Um, now, what are the sectors? Uh, uh, clean and uh, clean energy and transport is something that is mentioned in the uh, in the strategy. So, uh, apart from electric vehicles, there is also focus on green hydrogen for like heavy transport, for instance. There is also uh, emphasis laid on digitalization, electrification, uh, blue economy strategies, which includes not just energy aspects but also fisheries management and as well as disaster risk reduction preparedness, uh, preparedness etc. Uh, now to come to where does you know what are the challenges and what are the issues that EU needs to focus on from now on? Um, I mean, you know, uh, from from my perspective and from whatever I have understood uh, about energy transitions itself, it's very important for the EU to look at. Yes, there is uh, you know supply chain resilience initiative, there is quad, there is uh, there is enough scope for revitalizing the Paris Agreement, uh, you know, rule of law, all of that. But it's important that trans, you know the implications of tra uh, transitions are also taken into consideration, whether it is decentralization, diffusion, or as I mentioned about you know trying to have the idea of super grids, which is you know something like much grander kind of project, like you know some uh, for example you know one sun one world one grid for instance, which was launched during the recent COP. Um, the, you know, uh, so there are, of course, lock-in effects of energy systems as well. There is, you know, a large number of workforce which is still dependent on fossil fuel sectors. We also need to take into consideration the kind of land use change that may be uh, as a, that may result from this kind of energy transition policies. Uh, there are already existing land conflicts over diversion of land for renewable energy projects. Um, so, you know, the just transition aspect will have to also look at the workforce. Also, the land issues, also, you know, water issues and other issues which are so critical to the success of the transition itself. Um, yes, um, I mean, there is also, you know, there is also a lot of, uh, and, and there is also a lot of uh, research that is going on about creating regional grid communities, which is considered to be more stable uh, than, say, you know, decentralized sort of uh, uh, systems. Now, of course, the super grids or these large grids, uh, which are being touted as a solution for, uh, you know, energy security and any energy self-reliance and all these issues, uh, we also have to remember that these are also highly vulnerable to cyber attacks, for instance. 
So how does that? Uh, how how do we take the? How do we take those uh, uh, those kind of challenges also uh, on board? Uh, the impact of COVID-19 on, on green projects or renewable energy projects is something that is well known. But actually, if you look at the amount of investment that has uh, flown into uh, renewable energy projects, uh, I think the, it, you know, the, the market is quite, quite positive. The signs are quite positive. So that means something like the EU Green Deal, for instance, can be used as a, as a sort of a, a launch pad for enhancing cooperation. Uh, not just with you know the traditional partners like Japan, India, Singapore, all these countries have already been working with the EU, but also with newer sort of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, countries. Um, now, uh, uh, so uh, so can there be like also like for instance geopolitical conflicts over uh, over renewable energy? Now this is an interesting uh, uh, scenario because we have seen in the past, for instance. China's dominance in the uh, in the critical mineral sector is something that has been touted as a problem uh, for every country, right? So we have seen how China has banned uh, rare earths exports to Japan after a geopolitical conflict. Now this is something which is also driving countries to, in fact, uh, diversify their supply chain and critical mineral values chain. This is very important for the sustainability of of uh, uh, of uh, uh, you know. Um, uh, of the, the transitions. So in that sense, all these issues become important. I see that I'm run, I've run out of time. So maybe I'll just uh, I'll just conclude here and say that uh, the the EU's policy towards uh, towards uh, the Indo-Pacific has to be guided by the local sort of context and also understand these challenges in a much deeper way. Um, I mean, as much as it uh, deals with these multilateral kind of uh, uh, settings and multilateral sort of uh, frameworks uh, which are still fairly new, and we have to see how these uh, how these operate uh, at a much grander level as we expect. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for that <clears throat> important statement and, and speech. Um, and we will uh, move <clears throat> move on to our third speaker of this session. It is uh, again, if I mispronounce it, please excuse me. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Mr. Ashes Basue. Uh, who is a, a, an important corporate uh, executive and climate expert. He will speak on the topic of how to use renewable energy across continental experience. Uh, so please, uh, Mr. Basso. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning from uh, a very cold Canada. And thank you to all the organizers for inviting me to this. Uh, I'm not an academician. Uh, come from the corporate sector, and uh, you did pronounce my name perfectly. Thank you for that. Uh, essentially, I'll be focusing on uh, solar energy, and um, I don't really have a presentation per se, but uh, what I'll do is I've got a few notes. I'll refer to them as we go along. Uh, let's start with one thing. We all agree that climate change is reaching crisis proportions, and it is incumbent upon all of us to find ways to mitigate the harmful effects. This can be done in several ways from reducing the use of fossil fuels, plastics, internal combustion engines, replacing them with solar energy, sustainable materials, and lithium ion powered automobiles, aircraft, ships, two wheelers, garden machines, forklift, and where possible. I will focus mainly on the commercialization of solar energy across the world. The most common use of solar energy is to harness the power of sun to generate electricity for a multitude of applications from powering homes, factories, small appliances, parking meters, and signage. The list is not exhaust exhausted. At this point, I'd just like to mention one of the most common things that we see where uh, this started maybe 15 or 20 years ago, we started seeing calculators with little solar panels. So that was one of the earliest um, uh, uses of solar on a very small scale. Solar parks are being set up in many countries around the world. And uh, next, I have some data, which is, uh, I won't go through the whole thing, but what's interesting is that the largest solar park has been set up in Rajasthan, India, with a capacity of 2,245 megawatts, followed by one in China, which is just short by 45 megawatts. Now, what's interesting in all this is you have all these parks. However, the country that has the most solar power is China with 254, 355 megawatts, 
followed by the European Union, the United States, Japan, and Germany. So five countries with the most solar power capacity per, capaci uh, per capita is Australia, Germany, Japan, Netherlands, and Belgium. Now, one of the best ways to advocate for solar energy is to compare the most water stressed countries with their solar potential. Because obviously, as Ashok had mentioned earlier, hydro generation, hydro use is one of the biggest generators of electricity at this point in time. So it's important that the most water stressed country with their solar potential, solar potential since power generation solar photovoltaic power plants requires minimal water use. Now that's very important. Now the five top st water stress countries that could harness the most solar energy based on solar irradiance is Yemen, Eritrea, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and Libya, which presents a rather interesting uh, point of view. Of course, Yemen is in conflict, so it may be little, Eritrea again is in trouble now, uh, Saudi have embarked on a massive green energy program, and they are definitely trying to lead the way. Uh, Oman and Libya, well, Libya is in trouble too. Now, the electricity generated by solar panels has to be stored for use later. The most common means of storage has been lead-acid batteries, which are being replaced by lithium-ion batteries, ranging in size from standard automotive batteries to units, Built within 40 foot shipping containers, I was involved in one of those used by large utility companies. Now here we come to a rather important uh, point. The lithium ion battery industry has made great strides in the past 10 years with costs coming down with each passing year, which will increase the use of solar energy. And I might add, as we may be aware, that the cost of the photovoltaic cells has come down considerably uh, to a point where now increasingly, at least here in Canada, I notice that a number of people are going for uh, solar panels in their own houses by uh, fixing the solar panels to the roof to connect it to a, a battery bank. So that's, that's becoming very common. Now, the recently concluded COP26 in Glasgow has for the first time stated that the use of coal for generating electricity must be phased down. As you may recall, if you did follow the proceedings, it was supposed to be phased out. However, it will not be possible given the massive use of coal in countries like China, India, and the United States. But however, this will boost the use of alternative renewable energy from various sources like solar, wind, green hydrogen, and lithium ion uh, batteries. The cost of solar panels and photovoltaic cells have come down substantially. The only limitation for large scale conversion is the availability of land and batteries. Despite this, India has an airport powered by solar energy. It's in Southern India and it's the Kochi airport. Now, uh, to focus specifically on Sweden and Japan, I'll start with Japan. After the uh, Fukushima disaster, there has been a move towards using other means. And I think Japan is catching up. And as initially said, that Japan has been a little slow, but definitely will be picking up. Sweden is one of the leading world leading countries in the transition of renewable energy. And Sweden plans to operate in all sectors with 100% renewable energy, power generation by 2040, and reduce greenhouse emissions to zero by 2045. Japan. Solar power has become an important national priority since the country's shift in policies towards renewable energy after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in 2011. By the end of 2017, cumulative capacity reached 50 gigawatts, the world's second largest solar PV installed capacity behind China. I think that's very significant. Overall installed capacity in 2016 was estimated to be sufficient to supply almost 5% of the nation's annual electricity demand. Now, one of the more um, important things over here is that 
there has to be what I call a public-private partnership. While we rely on governments, it is quite obvious. And I think, as mentioned earlier, it has to come down to the private sector. Because when we look at organizations, uh, large organizations, governmental organizations, or even the COP, um, you know, a lot of people have leveled criticism against COP and saying, you know, it's just all about greenwashing. However, if the private sector, and I think one of the more critical aspects of this, which these smaller countries expressed at COP26 is that the richer countries uh, did not fulfill their promise of releasing the $100 billion, $100 billion towards helping them adapt to climate change. And I think one of the most vocal uh, people was uh, Professor Huck, uh, because countries like Bangladesh and others are facing imminent threat from climate change. But that's a separate issue. Coming back to the private sector, it will be very important. And I think um, the most common ways to encourage the private sector is to give them uh, whatever duty rebates, uh, incentives are possible. Only then will there be a meaningful uh, transition to a renewable energy, particularly with solar. As far as land use is concerned, um, there are plenty of uh, instances where, for instance, in China, there's a huge um, uh, mountain which has been covered with solar panels. So really, it's, it's not something which is very difficult. It does not require extensive labor, unlike hydroelectric dams. Therefore, I, use, I, I believe that solar energy in time will become a very efficient mode of generating electricity coupled with the availability of lithium ion batteries. And therefore, it's something which should be uh, promoted by governments, uh, there could be more intergovernmental cooperation and at possibly at the level of United Nations or um, other such large international bodies. Having said that, I will conclude here and I look forward to a discussion on some of these points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting to listen to you. Um, we have now as a discussant, uh, Mr. Yasiru Ranara, uh, who will uh, comment on uh, what has been said. He is a director at the Belt and Road Initiative in Sri Lanka. So I would like to hand over the mic to uh, Mr. Ranara Jha, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it was an interesting talk by Mr. Basu. Uh, what I want to focus on is also the same, <coughs> same discipline, which is uh, which is the guiding principle of the uh, international climate change regime, which is uh, the common but differentiated responsibilities principle. So <clears throat> this principle probably is the main principle that brought all countries together and brought all nations towards discussing the climate change regime uh, since the UNFCCC. But the, the, it changed during the Kyoto Protocol and now during the Paris Agreement with the NDCs the, the interpretation of the principle has, has gone into different branches. So if you go, go to the basic, if you break down the principle into two sectors, one is the common responsibility and one is the differentiated responsibility. So the common responsibility is obviously the climate crisis that we're having here. And the differentiated responsibility is that some nations are, are unfairly treated during the climate because of the climate change regime at the present time. And if you take, for example, historical admissions, what we have right now uh, in the atmosphere, around 80% of GSGs were admitted, uh, admitted during the Industrial Revolution era, as it, that is 1800s. So it's, there's a huge gap where the developing countries struggle to get their basic infrastructure done in many nations uh, across Asia especially. So which limits the, the, the development sectors of these countries. That's why uh, most of the countries turn into other uh, non-official funding partners as, as, uh, uh, as uh, national agreements, which is with China and goes with India and so on. So Belt and Road Initiative is also coming there where Chinese fund a lot of infrastructure there uh, and uh, try to build, uh, you know, especially African nations and Asian nations. So this happened because uh, most nations were unable to communicate properly 
uh, within the principle uh, within this principle and and most developed countries uh, lacked uh, their commitment towards uh, funding uh, the green climate fund as the as the speaker just spoke so i think uh, my uh, point here is just to uh, uh, re-engage uh, the whole regime with the with the belt uh, with the with the CD, cdbr principle so that uh, we can have a meaningful work done because if you take from here to the uh, next uh, three to four decades many countries as india china indonesia these countries are, are, are urging to develop their their infrastructure so obviously they are their emissions will will peak in this in this uh, in this in these few decades, so it's up to the G it's it's up to the G G seven nations or G twenty nations to sit and bring forward a workable framework because if you take right now around uh, eighty percent of GSGs at present is admitted by the G twenty nations, so we have two hundred and uh, hundred and odd countries in the Paris Agreement, so it it won't tally with all the uh, numbers because uh, if we get NDCs, then few countries uh, are not acting upon it. And then it's not ambitious enough to meet the uh, 2050 uh, uh, target. So uh, 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 this, uh, other than that, uh, NDCs, uh, then there is other uh, sectors as the aviation sector and the and the shipping sector, which also revolves around the CDBR principle, yet these uh, these sectors are also struggling to meet uh, the correct definition, legalized definition of the CDBR principle. So, uh, so my question boils down to: Is is the original purpose of the CDBR principle is reflected in the current global climate change regime, and how is the CDBR principle affected the climate change regime up to now? Is, is it is it is there a purpose of having this principle for the for the uh, or is just there for the sake sake of having it uh, and why is the principle needed in the Paris Agreement and what are the roles we have in the climate change uh, current climate change regime and the future regime revolve around this principle so these are the main areas that uh, I I especially work on because it's very fair it's very uh, it's not represented a lot in the in the Paris. Uh, in the Paris uh, Agreement, because most of the countries are uh, focusing on NDCs, though NDCs also do, uh, give a very unfair uh, approach towards developing countries and poor countries, uh, least developed countries, and so on. Uh, so that is my basic uh, discussion here. I hope uh, others have any comments on that. Well, thank you very much. Um, we don't have too many uh, too much time to for for a general discussion um but uh, i'm sure that one of one or two of the speakers uh, have perhaps a comment or two so if if you do please um, raise your hand in in one way or the other by, by or use the chat function i'll see if i can uh, distribute it uh, your questions or distribute your questions uh, fairly uh, does anyone have anything to say I do not see um, any hand uh, or any question. Uh, so we have uh, four minutes for uh, for a question <laughs> and answer to the, the the person who the question is posed. So if you do have that, please make yourself known. The floor is open. It seems that the um, the speakers have done an excellent job in delivering uh, truths and, and, and facts that we just have to take time and, and consume and, and put into action somehow. Um, if that is the case, I would like to give uh, the microphone again to uh, Ms. Mahima Dugal, who will uh, guide us uh, on our uh, continued discussion and in, in this um, webinar. Let me thank you all very much for your presentations and for listening to the presentations. And I look forward to a uh, continuation of this uh, important uh, webinar. 
So thank you all very much. Ms. Dugger? Yes, uh, thank you, Ambassador Wago. Um, I think uh, we'll take a short break now before the next session. Uh, let us reconvene at uh, 10.35 a.m. Uh, Central European time or uh, 6.35 p.m. Japan Standard Time. So uh, I'll, I'll see you all in about 10 minutes. Thank you. The second session. Okay, thank you very much, Mahima. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. The second session, we're going to discuss renewable energy in Sweden by inviting three distinguished speakers, Dr. Cecilia Higa from Swedish Bioenergy Association and Dr. Malia A. Peterson, Lula University Technology and ben, Dr. Ben Strick from Maradan University. And we are, three speakers are requested to make a presentation for 15 minutes respectively. After that, I'd like to invite Another dis distinguished discussant, uh, Ms. Lydia Powell. Then let's have the panel discussion. Well, first of all, may I ask that Dr. Cecilia Higa to make a presentation. The Dr. Higa is going to talk about biofuel policies. Uh, Dr. Higa, please. Just a moment, please. I will share my screen. Okay, so good morning. Good morning for Sweden. Oyasuminasai for Japan. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank ISDP for the invitation today. It's an honor for my, my company and also for me to be here in this high level event. And I would like to start presenting my company, the Swedish Bioenergy Association. And I could say that we have <coughs> two main branches taken into account. The first one, Svebio can be considered a boutique consultancy and we are focused on bioenergy and mainly biofuels and biomass. And then considering the second branch, we are also a lobbying and networking organization supporting bioenergy in Sweden and also in the Nordic area. And then this is me. Um, currently, I am a project manager at Svebio, and I have a PhD in energy system planning by the School of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Pampinas in Brazil, which included a one-year period at the Royal Technology Institute here in Stockholm, Sweden. And I also have an MBA in business and strategic planning by the School of Management from Kagawa University in Japan. And my bachelor and my master were in the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, which I consider my home university. And I am also working to the European, in the public relations department in the European Young Engineers, which is an organization trying to increase the dialogue between industry, academia, and government. And here we have a brief summary of my presentation, and I'm talking about biofuels in Sweden. And this is the structure that I will follow today. After the introduction, I will talk about biofuels in the transport sector. And then I approach the main drivers for biofuel policies and policies promoting biofuels. And then we have the Swedish carbon tax as a remarkable policy in Sweden related to the bioenergy and biofuels field. And closing this presentation, we have some lessons from Sweden that perhaps can be applied to other countries that would like to decarbonize their energy matrices. So we can say that the search for alternative fuels replacing petroleum within the transportation sector began already five decades ago in Sweden. And there were and still are many reasons for that. For example, high and volatile prices of oil, uncertainty of supplies, uncertainties related to reliance on supply from politically unstable regions and raised awareness of environmental damages. And especially considering Sweden, I could say that the three first reasons were more important in the past 
especially because of the first and the second oil shock prices, because Sweden was uh, dramatically hit by the first and the second oil shock prices. And after that, the country was starting to follow for alternatives to, to trying to avoid these happening. And the last one raised awareness of environmental damages. Probably this is the most important one. And I, it's, there is a connection with the main drivers that I am talking in the next slides. When here in this slide, when we consider the European context, Sweden is a recognized global leader in decarbonization. Uh, and this is also because of its renewable sources in transport, as we can see in this graph that is showing the share of energy from renewable sources in transport in 2019. And here is also important to point that Sweden has opt opted not to divide its renewable energy targets into sub-targets by sector. Thus, Sweden has no specific targets for bioenergy apart from the targets that were set by the Renewable Energy Directive. Sorry. And here we have the increasing trend in biofuels from 1995 to 2018. And in Sweden, uh, it's important because the country counts with a substantial and growing supply of bioenergy. And mostly of this bioenergy is originated from domestic forest sources. And in this graph, it's also important to say that from 2007 to 2017, the supply of biomass based fuels and waste increased by 24% across transport and heat generation among other sectors. And oil supply decreased by 20% due to increasing use of biofuels in the transport sector and also biomass in the heating sector. Then here, uh, we have the main drivers for biofuel policies. The two most important ones today are climate change and the decreasing of greenhouse gases emissions. And we also have energy security, technology development towards a circular bi bioeconomy and job creation as important drivers. And for sure, sustainability is the key element in policies for energy, climate and environment. Then we have some policies promoting biofuels and we have many policies in Sweden from the demand side and also from the supply side. And unfortunately, today we don't have time to explore all of these policies. But if you have any question about these policies, you can send me an email and I will be very happy answering it. Uh, but I selected the carbon tax as an important or a remarkable policy to explore a bit today. The carbon tax was adopted in 1991 in Sweden alongside an already existing energy tax and it remains a cornerstone in the Swedish uh, climate policy. It's also important to say that over time the carbon tax uh, was increased, it's important contributing to a broad range of climate objectives and targets in the country. And the carbon tax also can be considered a key instrument for energy transition. And why? Because it's easy to apply, it's easy to calculate. This policy is also tax neutral and considering some economic reasons in countries with large fossil fuel imports, the carbon tax can stimulate the interim economy and improve terms of trade. And finally, this policy is also very efficient being based on the polluter pays principle. Here we have the Swedish carbon tax. And uh, since 1991, Sweden has experienced rapid economical growth and decreased carbon emissions. And the carbon tax is levied on all fossil fuels at the production. And for sure, bioenergy and biofuels does not pay carbon tax.
Finally, closing this presentation, we have some lessons from the Swedish carbon tax. The first one, which is related to the last graph that we saw, is that reduced emissions can be combined with long-term economic development and prosperity. And I think Sweden is the best case to consider this lesson. And then considering the second one, progressive approach gives time for households and firms to adapt. And this is very important because the carbon tax in Sweden was progressively increased. And we also have in the third lesson, the importance of public opinion, because we have stakeholders and academia and government, and not all of these police actors were supporting the carbon tax, but the majority of them were supporting the carbon tax since 1991. And this report remains solid until today. Also because of the transparency that this policy has and had in Sweden. And last but not least, we have low administrative costs being always a good option. And I think we all know that this is a very important factor or the Ministry of Taxes will always be happy with this issue. And now I'd like to say thanks again. And I, unfortunately, I will not be able to continue in the panel today because I need to join my companies at my company now because we are presenting, we are working in another workshop for the International Energy Association today. And I would like to say thanks for all of you. And if you have any questions, you can send me an email. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Higa. I think your presentation, it's a very interesting to point out that carbon tax is a cornerstone. In the previous session, Mr. Buzzer pointed out that in order to encourage the private sector, a tax is, or duty is the, one of the key points. So I think it's a quite interesting to recognize that. So next, may I ask Dr. Patterson to make a presentation? Uh, Dr. Patterson would talk about the wind power, land use, opposing interest, and potential global conflict. So Dr. Patterson, please. Thank you so much. I will share my screen. Uh, first, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers at uh, ISDP for inviting me to this symposium. This is my first time in this, uh, in this group. Uh, my presentation is entitled Legal Preconditions for Wind Power Development in Sweden. And uh, it covers a description uh, of the rules that form the basis for the examination and assessment of permit. Uh, for environmentally hazardous activities, which is the legal term for, for example, wind power installations. These issues include, this includes uh, issues of land use uh, and the function of intended conflict resolution mechanisms. Uh, and I will also give you a brief review of case law in order to concretize the legal preconditions for establishing wind power in Sweden. Uh, the rule of law in the context of wind power development, uh, or any other development for that matter, uh, as far as it can be defined as environmentally hazardous, is to exercise control over the activity. So environmental law is not per se aimed at prohibiting or even restricting activities, but to see to it that they are conducted with as little negative impacts on human health and the environment as possible. So in this sense, uh, environmental law is a risk management instrument aiming to ensure that the risks for human health and the environment posed by different industrial activities are minimized. So the, in Sweden, uh, the main legislation is the environmental code. And the code does this, for example, by stipulating what is allowed and what is not allowed and through substantive rules that specify how activities can be conducted. However, 
it must be kept in mind here that the law as such aim at protecting a very large number of interests, public as well as private, at the same time as the overall objective of the environmental legislation, primarily than the environmental code, is to promote sustainable development. And in this, there are some potentially very difficult uh, issues to discuss. On the one hand, the assessment in relation to specific interests or activities must be tailored to local conditions. It must be based on local impact and local interests. On the other hand, sustainable development may require a more systemic perspective where national or, or even global aspects are taken into consideration in this assessment. So the development of renewable energy, as we have heard today, is such a global interest. And a very important question for my research uh, is how that could be better reflected in the individual permit assessment. So with that said, I will move to the substantive rules that set the framework for the activity. The environmental code includes overarching provisions regarding land use. For example, guidelines for the trade-off and ultimately the choice between different competing land use activities. According to these regulations, land and water areas shall be used for that or the purposes for which they are most suitable. The starting point for this assessment is the character and location of the area and present societal needs. So it is in this assessment and this assessment only that it is possible to take into consideration societal benefits of, for example, industrial uh, activities. For the development of wind power, which requires rather substantive land or water areas, this assessment is key. In order to pave the way for strategic use of land and water areas, some uses have been highlighted in the legal text. Uh, this includes reindeer herding, minerals extraction, and energy production. And these areas that are suitable for these purposes can be designated as national interests, for example, and for wind power. In that case, the wind power interest will have an advantage in relation to other land use interests that compete over the same area. The advantage, however, only consists of that the production per se, that, that the other interest must not significantly obstruct the use of the area for wind power. Uh, it is not a protection. Uh, it is a rather a mechanism to steer the use of land to some extent. In practice, there are often many, many national interests designated in the same area. Uh, and if this is the case, the only guideline given by the law is uh, that the purpose that best supports a long-term resource management should take precedence. So this is a very vague uh, guideline it's very difficult to apply these rules. There is a lot of case law regarding the assessment for wind power. However, it's not unambiguous, which of course is due to the fact that it is uh, an assessment on a case-to-case -case basis with different conditions locally. In a longer perspective, it is however possible to see some trends um, to begin with, and that is in Sweden, the end of the 1990s, wind power projects were frequently rejected on the basis of landscape values and view. This changed uh, after 2005 uh, and thereafter followed a period where many, many wind power projects were granted permits, some even in the presence of golden eagles. And the motivation for this was that it was in keeping with the EU renewable energy and climate policies. And since then, the resistance, which was then initially about views and landscape, often quite subjective, uh, it has grown in step with the size and number of the wind turbines. Today, other land use interests come into conflict with wind power to a much greater extent, and the issues are more and more often about green versus green, and I will get back to that in my last point. 
The environmental code also includes substantive rules in the form of environmental requirements uh, with which the operator is obliged to comply. The, the requirements concern, for example, the choice of location, precautions, the use of technology, and the management of waste. Regarding the choice of location, the operator is required to locate the activity at the best possible place seen from the point of view of the environment. This means two things. First, that several alternative locations should be investigated and presented. And secondly, that out of these alternatives, the place that involves the least intrusion and inconvenience for human health and the environment must be chosen. This location principle is closely connected to the land use regulations that I just talked about. The operator is also obliged to take the necessary precaution, precautionary measures to minimize environmental impact of the operation. And this includes the use of the best possible techniques for the construction, running and dismantling of the activity. It is important to note that the burden of proof regarding the compliance with environmental requirements rests on the operator. And just as international and EU environmental law, the Swedish environmental code rests heavily on principles, for example, for the assessment of risk. Uh, in the case of decisions under uncertainty, for example, regarding the expected negative impacts of a particular activity, the assessment shall be guided by the precautionary principle. A recourse to the precautionary principle means that precautions can be required even if scientific evidence is lacking. From the point of view of environmental protection, it is considered imperative that precautionary measures are taken already when there is a risk of damage to the environment. Swedish law says damage. In national law, they speak of ir uh, irreversible damage. Although the purpose of the requirement is to assure a high level of protection for the environment, uh, it is also important that they are not unreasonable. Therefore, an evaluation of the environmental benefits versus the costs associated with the precautions uh, are as main rule made in the assessment. Uh, regarding case law, the environmental impacts to be addressed through the environmental requirements in the permit process for wind power are on the one hand, the very same as they were 20 years ago. Uh, noise, shadows, uh, roads, ice tossing, disturbance of animals and habitat destruction, etc. And on the other hand, they are vastly different, mainly due to the size of the modern turbines. The location is still the most pressing issue in the assessment. Steering clear of protected areas, reindeer herding land, bird migration paths, and so on, uh, is not just a precondition to gain permit, but it may also imply that otherwise necessary precautions can be avoided. Technological developments are important here, since many environmental consequences can be mitigated through uh, innovative techniques. So, In parallel with this roughly outlined development of the legal preconditions for wind power, other issues has gained legal attention. Some of these have perhaps never been compatible with wind power development, uh, such as species protection, in particular birds, the halting of biodiversity losses and cultural, cultural protection. But in relation to other interests, such as mining and forestry, wind power as a renewable energy source had the benefit of being greener. Today, wind power is facing other equally green issues in the competition for land and other resources. Using the forest for biomass production and mining for green minerals for the green industrial tr transition are only two examples of formerly not so green activities that are now on the same playing field as wind power. The conflicting goals are no longer clearly on opposite sides of sustainable development. And this poses a challenge for both permit authorities and other key actors, such as the Environmental Protection Agency, who serves as the voice for the environment in the permit assessment. It is also a challenge for the legal system, which has not been designed to handle these type of issues. So what we see is a new playing field where green interests stand against other green interests, 
and with this perhaps a need to reform environmental legislation to enable or at least not to obstruct uh, the foreseen green industrial transition. And this is particularly true for the north of Sweden. Uh, as many of you perhaps already know, there are numerous investments uh, uh, made or planned to be made up here in the north for green steel, for uh, fertilizers, uh, iron, um, iron made without carbon dioxide emissions and so on. So we, we are facing some very challenging times here, uh, in particular with regard to the permit assessment of these activities. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very specific explanation on the wind power. I understand the location is a pressing issue. And also, uh, I think it's a very important concept of green versus green. I think it's a really new concept for us to think about it. So may I ask uh, uh, Dr. Street to make your presentation on solar energy and farming conflict? Will you please start your presentation? Uh, thank you for the invitation to this seminar. I will uh, uh, hope you see my presentation now. Yes, I can see. Great. Uh, so the title of my talk is Can Agrivoltaics Solve the Solar Energy and Farming Conflict? Agrivoltaics is maybe a new term for you. It's when you combine the solar energy that is photovoltaics with agriculture on the same piece of land. And there is a trend in Europe that um, uh, you see the headings here from Italy and Portugal that they are going to subsidy installations of this type. Uh, myself, I am senior lecturer at Melodon University. I have been working for a long time at ABB Corporate Research. Um, it was during ABB period I started with photovoltaics 20 years ago. And it's amazing to see the, the evolution of uh, PV during this period. I'm also the Swedish representative in uh, two international energy agency power photovoltaic power system tasks. Um, but if we uh, start with a wider view, the, you know all that uh, uh, if we look at the world energy use, there we have a lot of fossil. I, I used to call this the real 50 shades of gray. It's almost all oil, coal, and natural gas. Uh, and as we can see here, uh, solar energy is not mentioned specifically. It's within these renewables in the, this uh, green area. So here we have wind, biomass, and solar. And actually, solar is less than 1% of the world energy used today. And one can wonder, why is that so? Well, it's, it's not because of the resources. If we look at the solar resource, uh, this shows the solar irradiance. The, the yellow circle here is the solar irradiance on the land area on Earth, the yearly irradiance, and that, that is about 1,000 times higher than the world energy use. So there is no lack of resources. Um, and especially if you compare with all other resources we have, this is the biggest resource. So, in the future, we can expect to have much more solar. Uh, one reason why solar hasn't been uh, uh, bigger than it is at the moment has been the cost. The photovoltaic effect discovered about 180 years ago, so it's known since a long time, but the first application you can say was in space in 1958. That became a success and since then, the research and development has um, taken uh, solar to much higher efficiency and much lower costs. So it started with off-grid applications like here in Sweden, like lighthouses and emergency phones in the mountains in the late 1970s. Uh, during the 
um, the last 20 years, we have seen PV on buildings, we have seen larger solar parks and building integrated PV like this facade in Uppsala. If you see it in the distance, you don't understand that this is all covered with uh, PV modules. And uh, I especially like that we also can get different colors now. And this company from Swiss, Switzerland, they have a color called Fala Red. Fala Red is a typical color of houses in Sweden. So we especially like that. And lately, we also see these agrivoltaics coming up that I will uh, talk a little bit more about. Um, if we look at the trend in PV, when I started in 2002, the, it's not on the scale here, PV at that time. But since then, it has been increasing a lot. So now we have 760 gigawatt, and of that, 2.8 is agri. Uh, agrivoltaics. So if we look at the electricity, 3.7 is PV today. And um, if we look at PV per capita, we see that Japan is number three in the world. So you are in the forefront here with 565 watt per capita. But we also see that Germany is number two, 649 watt per capita. And uh, here in Sweden, we like sun and we often go to vacation to sunny places, but we don't go to Germany. That's not what we consider to be the most sunny place. So you can wonder why is Germany so high? Well, that is because they started very early with subsidies with feed-in tariffs for solar. So they created the market already in 2004, five, they started with this. And um, also solar is as a large share of the electricity in Germany. It's about 10% of the electricity share last year. And why do I mention this? Yeah, well, the solar irradiance in the northern half of Germany is in the same order as in the southern part of Sweden. So here in Sweden, we can look into Germany and ask, that maybe we can go the same way. Um, Fraunhofer Institute, they have uh, done a report, a guideline for agrivoltaics, and there they made some calculation on the uh, future and the, the possibilities for agrivoltaics. And they come to the conclusion, if you only use 4% of the agricultural land for agrivoltaics, where you combine PV and agriculture, you can produce as much electricity as used in Germany at the moment. So the potential for, agri for agrivoltaics on agricultural land is, is very high. If we then go to Sweden, how much PV do we have? Well, only one gigawatt installed and 105 watt per capita. And here you see the distribution so while well, most people live in the south, so it's also here we have the most uh, PV installed. And it's today 0.7% of the electricity use in Sweden. Um, but the potential is much higher as we have seen. Um, like Germany, they are having 10%, so why not 10% for Sweden in the future? If we look at the electricity use in the past for Sweden, it's interesting to see that the electricity use in 2020 is the same as 30 years ago. And actually it, it has been a decline during the last uh, 20 years. And this decline, decline is in the same order as if we, if we take all passenger cars in Sweden and make them electric, that we will need a bit less than 13 terawatt hours and that's about the same amount as the decline we have had during the last 20 years. Uh, but if we look in the future, uh, it's expected to be totally different looking into the, the electricity use. Uh, these are different scenarios made by a Swedish grid that operate the transmission grid in Sweden. 
and they forecast that within the next 30 years the electricity use can be doubled and it's because we are not only going to electric cars we we have big factories producing batteries we have server uh, uh, big server halls and also if the industry are going to replace fossil with hydrogen produced by electrolysis we need a lot of more electricity so the question is where do we produce this electricity and how and that this might be an opportunity of course for wind but also for solar um, and there we see that uh, agrivoltaics where you combine PV and farming like uh, this drawing here uh, this is a schematic drawing of a research uh, facility we have outside Westeros where our university uh, is and um, here we have vertical uh, PV modules and a tractor can go behind this and uh, harvest uh, uh, this um, land in a regular way and in comparison we have here a reference system like how you build a regular solar park at the moment so we have an ongoing project on this on evaluation of the first agrivoltaic system in sweden financed by the swedish energy agency and we have some project partners here and also some scientific cooperation and if we look how it looks like when you harvest in our research facility it looks like this you the tractor can go between the rows of this agrivoltaic system and with this vertical uh, uh, rows um, you don't have any height limits for for the machine so that's one uh, feature of this kind of system and uh, the thing with this agrivoltaics that you avoid some conflicts if you put the regular solar park on agriculture land you will have a conflict between food production and electricity production and we need both if you have farmland you have a, a conflict that will probably be more severe in many parts of the world with water consumption about in the world about 70 percent of the water consumption is used for agriculture so it's of importance to uh, make that more efficient and if you go for agrivoltaics you can both produce electricity and both have some crop on this land and the good thing regarding to the crop is that with the a shading more shading on the land you also improve the uh, uh, water content in the ground so you can keep a higher crop yield and, and this is a quite new field so there are quite a lot of um, research questions for instance what is the best design this shows a different design we have like a roof ahead of the the things you are growing here uh, and also well how will the shading affect the crop yield is an important task and what will be the investment cost compared to a regular park here are some figures for a regular groundwater park for a vertical and also for a high fixed structure and you can have a high structure with a tracker where the modules follow the sun so these are questions we have started to study in our research project uh, if you compare the energy you can produce per square meter that can be an um, interesting key performance indicator in a regular solar park you have something like 60 to 70 kilowatt hours per square meter here in Sweden with agrivoltaics it's a bit lower between 30 and 50 you can say approximately depending on how you build your park here in Sweden we also 
energy forest on our culture land. And the interesting thing there is that the energy per square meter is, the gross energy is only one tenth of regular solar park with energy. Um, and the question is how much land is needed for this PV production if we want to produce a substantial share of P, uh, PV electricity in Sweden. So here I have made some theoretical calculations depending on what kind of systems you have. If you have a fixed system or a one axis tracking system, if you have a vertical system like this, or if you have some other system uh, with more um, less space between the rows. And we can see that if we, yeah, even with 100,000 uh, uh, hectares of land, we can produce a substantial share of electricity between 20 and 60% of the electricity use in Sweden. So actually it, it's not that much land we, we need if we go for agrivoltaics. But the question is, where do we have this land? So this shows the land use in Sweden. We have a lot of forest, a bit more than 60% is forest. We have inland waters, um, we have uh, mires and well, most of these areas are not suitable for PV. So you end up with that uh, agricultural land, arable or pasture land is the most suitable for agrivoltaics. And we have in total about 3 million hectares of agricultural land. And we saw in the last uh, figure before that we need maybe 100,000 hectares. So we have land enough if, uh, of agricultural land to be able to produce a high share of PV in Sweden. Uh, so here I did some other theoretical calculation. If we assume that we can produce 30 kilowatt hours per square meter a year with agrivoltaics, so we can, it's enough to use only like for instance, 5% of the land that is the area that is in lay land that it was not in use in 2020, then we can produce about 30% of our electricity use. And if we use 15% of the land that is uh, can be compared to all the land that is used for pasture, then we can produce as much as the yearly electricity use in Sweden. And if we go for the grassland and green fodder plants land, we can produce about uh, two times as much as the electricity use in Sweden. So this is of course theoretical, but uh, here I wanted to show that it has a great potential. And another benefit of using agriculture for PV is it's the cheapest land to do installations on. So we see this as a promising possibility. And I know that Japan has been in the forefront in this and started, well, maybe 15, 20 years ago to make installations on this. So in my last slide here, I, uh, I suggest that maybe we can come up with some cooperation in research on this between Japan and Sweden. That, that was, would, be, would be very nice. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's a quite impressive when with the very new concept, agrivoltaics, it can solve the solar energy and farming conflict. So now I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Lydia Powell to give us your comment on three distinguished speeches, uh, please. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it, the three presentations were very interesting. Uh, though I don't study uh, the energy and renewable energy situation in Sweden, I have looked at Japan uh, to some extent because uh, we do both countries use uh, uh, coal to some extent and also natural gas. Uh, in the first presentation, the point that was most interesting is the issue of carbon tax. In all presentations, the thought that I had in mind is uh, 
how many of these concepts can be applied to a relatively poor, very large country. Um, because both Japan and Sweden are relatively rich and Sweden is uh, extremely small compared to India. And ideas that may work in Sweden uh, may not be carried over to countries which are uh, densely populated uh, with large populations and uh, relatively poor. For example, the issue of carbon tax. Uh, in India, the price of energy sources, mainly fossil fuels, oil and coal, uh, are not really subsidized. They are heavily taxed and it, uh, it, you can think of it as an implicit carbon tax. Uh, which in a way uh, limits energy consumption. The energy consumption in India is much lower than world average electricity as well as primary energy. Uh, so concepts like carbon tax uh, are applicable to rich countries, but for poor countries which actually consume energy, which is not even adequate for decent quality of life, the idea of carbon tax is uh, challenging. On the presentation on wind energy, I think uh, India shares a lot of issues that were raised that this conflict over land, but in India, it's not a conflict between landscape and view uh, versus renewable energy generation. It's mostly agriculture, uh, land access to land for uh, habitations versus renewable energy. Land is in fact, uh, the most contested issue in India uh, for any infrastructure project, not just uh, renewable energy, for all forms of energy, land is the most difficult uh, issue in India. So this is uh, an issue that can be debated a lot. Uh, the last presentation was very interesting uh, because uh, again, India has a similar uh, program. It is called PM Kusum. I won't go into the expansion of the word Kusum, it's, it's in Hindi. Um, so this is all, this also um, tries to use solar panels in agricultural land so that farmers can pump water for irrigation. As you may know, in India, uh, electricity is subsidized in the sense at the, at the point of consumption, it is subsidized. Uh, and for very often for farmers, it is free or uh, charged only a flat rate. So the uh, marginal cost of pumping water becomes almost zero, which means farmers keep pumping groundwater. India, uh, as a result, India is the biggest user of uh, groundwater. Uh, it is, uh, it's uh, groundwater pumping is larger than the next two countries, which is the United States and China. So to reduce groundwater pumping using electricity, and also to generate additional income for farmers. Uh, India has come up with this uh, PM Kusum scheme where farmers install solar panels and try to sell back the electricity, partly use it for irrigation and partly sell it back to the grid. It hasn't been a large success, uh, but I think it will take time. Uh, I think the question again, I'd like to uh, like the three speakers to think about is uh, how many of these issues can be applied to a country which um, which has to industrialize while it also decarbonizes. Uh, Japan and Sweden have, uh, you have built your infrastructure, you've industrialized, your per person incomes uh, can give a very high quality of life to the citizens. In India, the process of industrialization is just beginning actually. Uh, most people don't have access to uh, many hard and soft infrastructure that you may take for granted in Sweden and uh, Japan. Uh, so how can a country uh, like India with very low per person incomes, very low per person electricity and energy consumption, can uh, use some of these ideas uh, to both industrialize and decarbonize at the same time. No other country has this challenge, I would say. Perhaps other countries in Africa uh, have the challenge, but among the large G20 countries, India is the only country which has to industrialize and decarbonize at the same time.
I think I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very important point. Uh, those who uh, those ideas are applicable to rich countries may not be applicable to poor countries as they are. And also it's very important how to industrialization, how to make industrialization and decarbonization compatible with each other. So I'd like to welcome your comment from Dr. Patterson. Would you, pay, would you respond to her comment? Yes, thank you, Lydia. Uh, uh, it was very interesting. I, since I'm not an engineer, uh, I can't really speak of the possibilities for the for establishing the specific technology. But uh, land as a scarce resource, I think, is common everywhere. Uh, we, we in Sweden and also in India. I've only been twice to India, uh, and I haven't seen obviously not seen the whole country, but I've seen parts of it. And the land conflicts, whether they are like in the 1990s in Sweden about individual views or if they are about uh, indigenous people's lands or agricultural, I think the mechanisms to solve these issues need to be in place. And that is, I think, where legislation uh, plays a big role because it sets the boundaries for how to look upon these issues. It's very important that we have guidelines for the trade-off between different interests. And I think that is true everywhere. Uh, perhaps there are remote areas uh, where this is not as big an issue as perhaps in India, which is very densely populated, at least in many parts. Uh, but on the other hand, there, there might be some technical issues. Uh, wind power can be installed off grid. Uh, and used for pumping water and, and other applications, uh, remote applications or, or even battery charging. But for the main, I mean, for the transition or, or the combating of, of climate change, of course, we need bigger wind farms uh, almost, and those need land and, and that use will conflict with other uses. So I, I guess I'm not gonna make another speech here, but my, my point is, is I think more that the, the shared the problems that I spoke of are shared with all countries. Thank you very much, Dr. Sreesh. Please, would you please make your comment? Yes, um, I think this um, agrivoltaics can be something to look into, and especially in countries with uh, warmer and drier climate, where you need uh, water for for your agriculture, that this can be a way also to manage the water consumption, that you can reduce the water consumption. That it, it has been seen in international research that, especially in warmer climate, that these agrivoltaics uh, installations can uh, uh, actually increase the, the yield uh, and in the same time reduce the water management. So I think this is a promising technique, especially since the land issue is the competition of land will be even more steeper in the future with the more, uh, more persons living around the world. So I think it's interesting to look into this kind of application in the future. Okay, thank you very much. I think I have a question from President Hiraizumi. Would you please ask your question? Yeah. Um, I wonder if the uh, presenter and uh, Lydia have read this book, Drawdown? Have you known this book? You don't know. Okay. Um, recently, I mean, th this book came out in uh, 2017, but I uh, discovered it quite recently because it came out of a pretty obscure, you know, publishing company in Japan. I mean, okay. in the state, it came out of Penguin. But you know, since the environment is not my field, I haven't really, you know, looked for this book. But this book was very interesting. Uh, they list 
a uh, hundred solutions to the reduction of warm house gas and rank them according to the contribution of each solution. And um, in reply to Lydia's question, I find it very interesting that in their list, in his list, I mean, uh, the guy is Paul Hawken. It, it's a book is called Drawdown. And it's written or edited by a guy named Paul Hawken, which is you know quite famous name. Even I know um, his name. And one of the interesting you know conclusion that I can draw from this book is that you know reducing food waste is very effective means of producing you know carbon related gas. It says, and a lot of other stuff related to food like plant plant rich diet also is very effective uh, this is what indians do don't eat meat then if you stick to it your contribution is immense and also um, uh, regenerative agriculture if you do that it also ranks very high and you know list goes on and on and on and i wonder i mean because since i'm not a scientist I don't know the validity of this book. It is an international bestseller. And it seems to me that everybody who engages in this environmental you know, issues have read it. And I wonder how many of you had read it, uh, especially because you know, this section was interesting in the sense that you know, when people talk about bio, you know, um, you know, power generation. The other talked about wind. The, yet another talked about solar. So there's a cross section of you know solutions lined up. And well, according to this book, you know, wind turbines onshore comes in second, and then uh, solar is I don't know. Bio is like thirty eighth, uh, a thirty fourth. And you know, uh, solar is somewhere in the middle. Uh, I think it's in the twenties. Um, but anyway, you know. Um, so uh, on a macro scale, I mean, the, the there is a hierarchy. Uh, you know, wind is most effective, and then then solar, and then bio. But of course, you know. The effectiveness of the project depends upon each individual cases, you know, needless to say. I mean, you have to do the numbers. Um, so, um, so in that respect, this doesn't help uh, in assessing each you know, project individually, but as a policy tool, I think this is, if this is true, then it's very effective. Uh, I wonder anybody has a comment on this validity of this book, uh, anybody has a, any criticism about this book uh, or comment? I welcome it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Pavel, what, what is your response? I haven't read the book to comment on it, but um, I only when I go through the items that are listed in the book, I can give a valid comment. But I think um, uh, some of the issues, for example, India, uh, Indians do not eat meat, but India has the largest cattle population in the world, about 500 million or more is the estimate. And India hasn't signed up to the methane pledge. Uh, cattle population is the largest emitter of methane. And uh, cows have a, a very significant uh, role in social life in India. And so um, eliminating meat and, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is possible, but eliminating cows, which are a source of methane emissions, methane, which is far more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, is the challenge. And uh, this is probably one of the explanations why India hasn't signed up to the methane pledge at uh, Glasgow. I think the uh, solutions to climate change 
um, are uh, context specific and country specific. I think the ideas that work in a country, in one country, may not be applied to another country in the same form. Maybe it has to be adapted and tweaked a little bit to suit the social and economic conditions of the particular country. I, I get that. The only point that I was making is that there's not in energy alone that you know serves the purpose of reducing you know uh, um, carbon related gas. You see, uh, you can do that through you know what kind of food you eat. You can do that through how you you know uh, regulate land use, that sort of thing. And there are like 80 solutions listed in this book. So take a look at it. So that, that's I, only- six. I will definitely go through it and get back to you by email. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We have two more questions uh, on, on the Q&A uh, column to uh, Dr. Street. Uh, one question is, uh, could the structures become a nesting site for birds and other vectors of food uh, foodborne pathogens? That's the one question. The second question is, uh, how do we avoid creating a new green curse to manufacture the solar panels? So, so Dr. Sri, would you please respond to these two questions? Uh, yes, this with biodiversity is an interesting question. And that is is an research topic related topic related to this agrivoltaics. So some believe that you can increase the biodiversity uh, in the same time as you uh, are installing these agrivoltaic systems. And for instance, if you um, get more insects like pollinators, that can also be a benefit for, for the crop you are growing. So that, that's a very interesting topic, but th this whole field is so new so far, so there is not so much research done on, on these topics, but it's something that we would like to study more. Um, yeah, a new green curse to manufacture the solar panels. Yeah, if you look, if you do a life cycle analysis, uh, uh, today the um, the carbon emissions you have from from um, the production, and um, um, but um, because you need some electricity for for the production, and depending on where you produce it, uh, it can be different uh, carbon emissions. But I I have read some figures that um, within a year or two you have. Uh, yeah, you have gained this um, during the um, running of the PV systems. And, and it depends on what electricity you play, re replace. The, the carbon in the uh, electricity production in Sweden is quite low, but we are connected to other countries uh, like the Scandinavian countries and also other countries in the Northern Europe. So it has been some estimates have been done that when we install PV, the, uh, the reduction of carbon e emissions will be uh, related to what's, what's in, uh, in the Northern Europe. So it, it's, it looks quite beneficial and with more renewable electricity production in the world, also the production of the PV systems, the PV modules will be more green. So um, I think we have to look at it from the bright side that we have a large potential in solar and of all uh, renewable energy sources, solar is the, has the biggest potential. And we have seen that the cost has gone down a lot. So in some countries, uh, solar can now uh, solar electricity can be produced cheaper than fossil electricity. So I think the, the future is bright for solar. 
Okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, please, the time is running out. So thank you very much for insightful speeches and candid comments and excellent questions. So now I'd like to pass it to Mahima. Uh, thank you, Takata-sensei. Um, let's, uh, let's take another short break before we reconvene for this uh, third session. So. Hello, everyone. And welcome to this third session of today, which is called Renewable Energy, Green Corporation, Green Growth, and the Private Sector. It will continue for an hour, and we have three distinguished speakers. The first speaker uh, is Mr. Addis Zebu. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He is a research fellow at the Stockholm Environmental Institute. In his research, he focuses on the transnational governance, particularly with regard to climate change adaptation. And today he will talk about climate resilient trade and supply chain management. The floor, the virtual floor is yours. If you're here. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't see there you are. <clears throat> okay. So, hi everyone. Sorry, I had to leave because I couldn't share my screen uh, before I did so, but I'm back. So, I'm sorry if I missed anything. I saw that you introduced me, Maria. So, I, is, it, is yes. it my turn? It's Good. your turn. I, I introduced you and I said some words about your research focus, but please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Excellent. Thank you. So first three uh, short caveats. So I'm working from home uh, where I connect my screen and that means that I need to hit, have my computer shut down. So I will do this without camera, but I will turn it on uh, after the presentation. Second, uh, if you hear a screaming child in the background, it's my son who is sick and cannot go to the kindergarten today. And third, and maybe the most important is a caveat here that I'm a little bit of the odd one out here because I'm an adaptation person and uh, this presentation will not really touch upon renewable energy uh, that much, uh, less even so green growth, but uh, at least the kind of the role of the private sector is, is the correct one. So. I hope you can see this presentation as a little bit of, an, of a portal into the world where we have kind of failed to seriously scale up renewable energy systems. So uh, yeah, my name is Aris Tebo. Now I will talk a little bit about uh, climate resilient uh, trade and supply chain management uh, and do that from uh, the perspective of uh, transboundary climate risks. So to start with this, this is an area of work that I've been uh, doing research on together with uh, other colleagues at Stockholm Environment Institute for a couple of years now. And, and, and it's kind of uh, during these years, it, 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 we, we've come to realize that this is an area where policymakers have, are increasingly acknowledging the significance of, of uh, transboundary climate risks. But, we also see that there is an insufficient understanding of, of where they originate, of, of how they travel and, and who is exposed. And, and the, the few studies that have been done to date uh, have been very kind of niche, very country or sector specific and, and mainly qualitative. And, and thus uh, the existing adaptation plans and strategies in, in basically all countries are overwhelmingly failing to identify or, or assess transboundary climate risks as a, as a serious uh, issue area. So in terms of uh, what transboundary climate risks are, they, they, they lie on the premise that uh, climate risks and impacts uh, cross national borders and affect all countries, irrespective of their uh, level of, of development. And uh, the way we are trying to conceptualize them uh, at SCI is uh, through this figure where we have kind of four pathways through which uh, climate risk uh, is transmitted and, and it can be, through a people pathway where we talk about, for example, uh, a change in tourism patterns or, or, or migration. It can also be around biophysical flows such as uh, countries sharing uh, transboundary water um, uh, resources. 
It can be around trade, uh, which I will touch upon a little bit soon, and similar around finance, how, how kind of financial flows and, and, and financial inf impacts are in this, in, uh, affected by climate impacts in one country uh, from another country. And uh, this, uh, these are kind of the products of borders and, and geography. So risks are transmitted through one region to another through systematic processes. And, with this in mind, we kind of see this that it, this establishes a concrete interest in the management of natural resources across borders, where both uh, producing and consuming economies may benefit of from effective risk management policies and, and transnational governance. So one way uh, we are looking at this is through uh, agricultural trade. So in this uh, latest uh, round of work that we, we have done, we have looked at trade in agricultural commodities and overlay that with, with import dependency and, and percentage of change in, in crop yields. And, and we've done that uh, currently for six uh, different commodities, uh, for rice, uh, for wheat, for soy, for maize, sugarcane, and coffee. And the kind of globe or global picture is that majority of, of agricultural commodities will uh, uh, have an, a change, a negative global change in yield uh, due to uh, climate risks and climate impacts. And we see that, for example, sugarcane up to 60% uh, of, the, of the current production of, of, of sugarcane might be, uh, uh, these areas might not, might be, might not be suitable for, for production. And with, with this picture in mind, we also see that there are some countries that are major uh, risk ex exporters. So in, for example, Brazil and China and US, USA and, and Thailand, and, uh, and this is different for different commodities, but also there are some crops uh, such as wheat where climate change will actually increase uh, global production. So it's, it, the picture is a little bit different for, for different, com different uh, commodities. So in, in the report, we are basically uh, providing uh, kind of, um, country profiles for, for, for certain countries. And for example, some of the, in, in terms of the major exporters of, of transboundary climate risks for, for Brazil, we can, for example, see which countries are most dependent and which country will be most negatively affected uh, by Brazilian production of certain commodities and, 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 and basically keeping, to, keeping that in mind for, for future bilateral uh, relationships. And in terms of uh, the, the other figure for Sweden, uh, we can see that uh, for Sweden, who is an importer risk, uh, there are some, some relationships that are strongly neg negative, but some, for example, in wheat uh, that are positive. So meaning that in some, some countries might be able to offset the negative uh, uh, production from, uh, or the de decrease of production from, from other countries in, for example, wheat, but also rice and soy. Uh, another way to visualize uh, these uh, risk relationships could be through Sankey diagrams. And here uh, I've se selected these mainly with Japan in mind. So uh, in, in here on left side, there is a maze uh, and on the right side, there's the uh, risk, the, the profile for soy. So US here is seen as a major exporter of, of climate risk to uh, many countries of which Japan is one of the, the, the most significant one and similar for, for soy. So here you can see, for example, that uh, Japan will be negatively infected, in, affected by a uh, decrease in production of soy in, in the United States, but could offset some of that by future production in Canada because climate models assume that uh, there will be uh, opportunity to produce uh, higher up in, 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 in latitudes in the, in the future. Uh, another way to uh, conceptualize transboundary climate risks could be through this a little bit confusing figure. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a bit difficult maybe to understand it uh, taken out of the context from the paper, but basically uh, it, it summarizes the, the, the flooding that occurred in Thailand in 2011 and how they had, uh, cross-border, how, how they had impact on other countries and, and, and the global financial system as well. So in 2011, uh, Thailand experienced one of its longest uh, duration flooding event 
which result, resulted in uh, over 100 deaths, deaths and, and almost 14 million people uh, being affected in, in the country. But beyond the kind of direct impacts on Thailand, uh, the impacts of it beyond its border was, were equally notable. So Bangkok is a region for, for large industrial par parks that host numerous uh, high value manufacturing uh, uh, production and uh, which were also located close to coastal port facilities to reduce transportation costs. And these industrial parks were badly affected from uh, the flooding, which led to enormous losses in, in, for example, the automobile and electronics industries. Uh, and here, primarily Japanese uh, companies were uh, affected due to the inundation of plants, which disrupted the whole uh, supply chain. Uh, the implications of this flooding, uh, which hit critically interconnected supply chains, led to impacts that propagated far beyond its borders. And, and for, for example, for Japan, these effects uh, were estimated to have reduced uh, Japan's uh, fourth quarter manufacturing production index by as much as 2.4%. Uh, as a response to that, the Japanese companies who were uh, most exposed to these ha hazards, they responded by diversifying procurement sources by stockpiling components, moving them up to higher elevation, but also at uh, lobbying and, 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 and uh, creating pressure on the Japanese International Cooperation Agency to actually invest uh, in a flood management plane uh, for the Tao Kaya River in, in Bangkok, which they uh, actually succeeded. So, you know, having established the, the 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 TCR, the next kind of part of this production, uh, this presentation will will go a little bit into what opportunities exist to manage uh, transboundary climate risks in the trade system and how they can be uh, governed. And uh, I will present this through a different study, which uh, takes the coffee sector. Uh, as a uh, case study and, and, and looks at the Brazilian German coffee supply chain uh, specifically. So this is a, a kind of empirically driven study based on, on interviews with, with 65 ex supply chain uh, experts in, both in Brazil and, and Germany and includes uh, meetings with uh, government actors, with international organizations, with private sustainability in initiatives, certification schemes, uh, but also kind of direct uh, supply chain actors like processors and coffee cooperatives with uh, traders and with roasters and, and with coffee retailers in, in both countries. And here we were interested in kind of three broad uh, issues uh, which concern first the, the kind of authority. And here uh, the question is framed around how can public and private supply chain actors exert influence over resource governance in, in Brazil. So here the kind of, the fundamental concern is that adaptation requires conceptualization both as a domestic issue where government needs to develop strong adaptation policy and as a global challenge with international dimensions. Uh, second one then is that under which conditions can these interventions actually be legitimate and here it's the, more around that it's important to, get, to see the acceptance of, of, of rulemaking authority among constituents and, and to whether people that are subjected to the rules uh, or commands or that where they at least do not, where they endorse or at least do not reject the authority of uh, an actor and institutions, even if they are uh, foreign. And then lastly, and most importantly, uh, what kind of, if we want to secure future agricultural production, what are the actual outcomes on, on smallholder farmers and how can these uh, governance interventions be successful? Uh, for lack of time, I will, mainly touch on question one and, and three here. And based on uh, the interviews, uh, we have kind of been able to uh, discern five governance pathways through which uh, transboundary climate risks uh, can be governed. And, and the first one here is the transnational governance, which is mainly focused around private and to a lesser extent public actors who cooperate to incentivize a behavioral change. And, and this, Take, occurs through, for example, certification schemes, through private finance and insurance and credit schemes and, and through public-private partnerships. Uh, there is also the, the second pathway that, that interview is touched upon where it was the development cooperation where uh, donor countries uh, supposed support the self-determined uh, development priorities of recipient countries. Uh, and it, that takes place around through development assistance, through capacity building and, and technology transfer. 
And then lastly, uh, or third, the international diplomacy where sovereign states negotiate as equals and agree on rules and regulations to intended to benefit both parties. And then we have also additional two uh, pathways where we kind of distinguish them because the ambition for in international governance is lower than the other ones. And here it's around global markets, so leaving everything to market forces and domestic policy where each kind of country uh, takes care of their own policy within their own borders. And basically to, to present our findings here on the, on the scale between what is mainly applied and what is mostly effective, uh, we see that kind of the transnational governance and the public private driven uh, initiatives are the ones that are most applied and there is most activities in this space through, for example, certification schemes and corporate social responsibility. And there is very high interest, but overall deemed uh, as insufficiently effective to deal with uh, future climate risk. In somewhere in the middle were, was development cooperation, uh, which with interviews framed as potentially highly effective under right circumstances, but in, in the kind of German Brazilian supply chain, there weren't really that many activities, even if kind of German development uh, agencies were much more active in other countries and mainly least developed one. And then kind of what was deemed as most effective, but also kind of least relevant was the international diplomacy where there is a very opportunity for strong ownership, but very low interest and, and mainly takes place at a higher abstraction scale than what can be of benefit to uh, smallholder farmers. And then lastly, the, the other two, uh, the, kind of the global markets one, which, which is the business as usual, whilst it still holds sway among some supply chain actors, but majority argues that markets alone was the least effective pathways to deal with these risks. And domestic policy, uh, was in terms of transboundary climate risk was not seen as a priority by countries and also the the, infor the policies that were there were there were weak enforcement uh, in them. So then to kind of go back and talk a little bit about, about the implications of, of this is that the, the stability of agricultural trade depends on success of adaptation in large agricultural exporting countries, especially US, China, and Brazil. And, and also the, that the kind of traditional supply chain management logic of repla replacing high risk suppliers with more resilient ones is not unlikely to work in a world where, where mo many countries are experiencing systemic risks from climate change. So instead, we argue that there is a shared interest between public and private actors to achieve uh, stronger climate resilience where importers uh, need to, need, importers would benefit when exporters are able to adapt to maintain uh, exports. And likely, the fact is that the, the whole system of trade is likely going to suffer uh, repeatedly crisis on this adaptation efforts are able to build more systemic resilience to climate change. And then the, from an international community perspective, we are as resilient as the most vulnerable around us. And to my last slide, sorry, I'm a little bit over time. Uh, from a kind of climate change point of view, there will be, if COVID and uh, kind of early PPE struggle is anything come by, there will be some countries that will react by trying to securitize access to food commodities. But that reaction will just be lead to return protect to protectionism, to more geopolitics, which will further destabilize markets and leave those countries who can least afford to compete even more vulnerable. So we are finding support support the case for increasing global ambition on adaptation and just adaptation at the national local scale, particularly in key exporting countries. And also then exporters must consider the wider effects of their own adaptation. And the both public actors and private actors adaptation strategies need to be better aligned uh, to, to maintain uh, future trade relationships. Uh, and then, yeah, to basically create international structures, Paris Agreement uh, is a starting point, but but much more effort needs to be put on this. And here are a couple of references. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very interesting uh, presentation. Our next presenter 
is uh, Professor Michael Goodsight from uh, the University of Adelaide. He is a professor in civil and environmental engineering. And uh, the title of his presentation today, I'm sure we will see in a few seconds since you're sharing your slide. Virtual floor is yours, Professor Goodsight. Thank you, uh, Professor Peterson. And is everybody seeing my screen okay? I'm, uh, I can see it, but I don't know if you can. We can see it. Great, thanks. Um, look, firstly, I'd like to thank Professor, or I'm sorry, President Hira Zumi and uh, Swanstrom uh, and their teams for inviting me to this uh, visionary session. Um, uh, Pro President Hira Zumi has an inspirational family legacy um, and I really enjoy these efforts between KIIP and ISDP and getting to solutions where all are winners instead of some are winners. Um, so one of the things I'm going to be focus focusing on, um, I think uh, Professor Pedersen will actually see a corollary to what she was talking about in her talk. Um, uh, and that is I've been working very closely with the mining sector in developing uh, what Australians call a cooperative research center bid for 2022, which is industry-led research. And it's supposed to be uh, international and global, just as the copper industry is. And copper industry is kind of a case for lots of different aspects. So I'd really encourage anybody to get involved um, and reach out. You'd be very welcome. So we're going to talk about the role of mining in green energy systems and the paradox of its negative impact on the environment. Um, I guess, you know, there's been some talk of curse in some of the earlier talks, but <clears throat> I like to talk about it as a, as a paradox. We're all aware of this uh, global challenge that the IPCC report has put out. Um, and uh, the way the mining industry sees it and uh, is that there's actually a challenge they have to meet. And that is, there is a need for more uh, materials and minerals to, to move towards a green society. In fact, um, uh, the IEA has done studies, not even the mining industry, and demonstrated that. Um, so a sustainable future needs minerals. And you can get into these numbers um, if you'd like, but to put it in perspective, um, with respect to copper is just one case. Society needs to mine more copper in the next almost 30 years to reach the stated 2050 goals than we've mined in the history of humankind. That's a lot of copper. Uh, luckily, it's there. The Supply and investment plans fall well short of what is needed to support an accelerated deployment of solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicles. That's again from an IEA report. So it's the IEA that's actually analyzed the fact that mines right now are operating many in many cases because the market's already strong at full capacity. So even when mines project their future production, they're not able to meet demand. So copper, the, the good news is, is copper is an element. We can change what form it's in on earth, but we don't really create or destroy it. It's there. There's also more copper to be discovered. The challenge is with discovery and exploration is that because we're so careful on the environment and I, I, I you know, um, just like with the windmill sector that Professor Pedersen talked about, mining is very careful. In fact, on global average, it takes 16 years to move from discovery of a mineable ore body or asset to first shovel of production. 16 years. So that's just two cycles of continuous discovery, if you like, um, before we get to our 2050 goals. So with existing operations though, although the ore bodies uh, um, uh, kind of amount of copper that you're getting in every ton of ore you're mining is declining, it's still there. 
it's what's called more complex and it's deeper. So it's more, you need, you require more energy and more water to get to it, but it's still there. In fact, when mining companies globally today say they're mining at full capacity, really they're only mining 5% of the known ore body on global average. And again, they're doing that because there's this balance between how much water and energy they use to get to uh, copper that they can sell at some price um, compared to um, how much water and energy and how much impact it, they would have on the environment to get to even more copper. And the market forces are interesting because it's almost in the market's own interest that copper's always um, lagging behind the true demand because that keeps the market price of copper per ton high. So there's interesting market uh, factors at work as well as externalities pushing on the environmental commitments. So it's complicated. So the mining companies, again, are making statements to their shareholders and to other stakeholders that I think uh, other people that are working as um, independent experts would challenge as to how exactly are they going to get there. It's fantastic they're making these statements, but I think they'll acknowledge, um, which is almost Australian national policy where I am, that technology has to be developed in order for them to actually meet their goals. So if you look at, when I say mine more copper in history to meet these 2050 goals, global mines, including the new ones that are about to be discovered and come into operation during the period, will all have to double their production. While at the same time, what's called the grade, so the amount of copper per ton of ore and um, resources are declining and they have to reduce their uh, stage one, two, and three emissions, their water and their waste at the same time. For some mine sites, it's easier than others. Um, some mine sites, water is actually in excess and other mine sites, such as many in, um, in Australia, for example, water is a precious resource and you have to deal with other contaminants than copper. Um, and uh, I think society, because of the circular economy and other needs for uh, rare earth elements and other elements that weren't even looked at before in copper mines, um, we're finding out that what might be a contaminant to some might be a product to others. And by processing those contaminants or reprocessing them, you're able to valorize a commodity society also needs and at the same time remediate the mine site. So we're working on that. We're planning on addressing this together with the industry through these three pillars of research along the value chain. And again, we, we're, we're looking at copper because it's so important to the green, uh, to the green um, uh, uh, energy system. But there's other elements that without working together with copper, you won't get there anyway. So it's important to see it as a system. We pick copper as a case in order to narrow in our study of focus, but I think there's a lot of corollaries. And if you look at the type of expertise mining companies need, they need to understand how can they use land use together with agrovoltaics, for example, um, because they, they, they remediate by converting land to, for example, um, agricultural land. If they can also put photovoltaics up there or um, drive some hydrogen energy systems, they'd be very open. They need to understand the legal system as an enabler rather than a barrier. And they need to understand social license and adaptation as enablers, also as barriers, or else there's no hope to get to the copper that we need to uh, green society. So if you look at this slide, um, Remembering that copper is an element, there's really no shortage of copper. There may be a shortage of what could be labeled sustainable copper or copper that's been gotten into in a sustainable manner. And in fact, I, I would argue there actually is a shortage. So what's the preference for companies and the environment in our preliminary studies, which, which aren't published yet and aren't tested. This is just as we're scoping our 
uh, international um, copper um, for tomorrow bid. That is our priority is to mine the more complex and deeper ore, then mine the mineral rather than mine the ore. And this refers to certain methods um, that people have called in situ or in place recovery, where you're injecting a benign liquid into uh, the earth. Copper is in a solution then, and you suck it up and you can do it um, at the same time protecting uh, the, the groundwater environment. Or if the groundwater environment's very saline, you can actually remediate the environment, the groundwater, so that it can become potable. So again, that can have benefits. Remine and rem remediate, recycle and reuse. Even if we were able to recycle and reuse every bit of copper, we'd only have 18% of the global copper to do that. Most copper is tied up in capital assets, such as long-term buildings. Um, and that means we'd have to tear down a building to recycle and reuse it, which has its own uh, footprint. And the last thing that we would want to do again is explore because exploration is one thing, but to get to production from exploration requires very careful and, and time consuming uh, uh, environmental studies. And that takes time that we don't have as we move towards 2050. Now, market forces are key. As, as some of the conversation we heard earlier, the finances, the, the risk management, it's all key. So towards the top of the pyramid, there's stronger market forces now and a lower risk. And as we move towards the bottom, there's stronger more market forces in the future and a higher risk. And in order to, to enact this, you have to have international frameworks, not only for reporting, but for accountability. And that's why I'm a real fan of uh, KIIP's um, championship of um, these, these international frameworks. Um, I'm not sure all countries will sign up to them, but that doesn't matter as long as uh, shareholders and global trade mechanisms demand them. So there is, there is a, uh, uh, something called the copper mark for sustainable copper, um, but nobody's really been able to price how much sustainable copper should cost. So in the future, and I'm an environmental engineer, I'm saying mining must be the solution, not the problem. So engineers are taught to remove problems when we have them. Um, this requires we solve the paradox of the negative impact on the environment to get to green energy for copper and other mineral, minerals. And we need to get to green and green, in my opinion, rather than green versus green, which Professor Pedersen gave an example of before. The mining industry is often set up as being at odds with other industries, but you can't have windmills without the minerals that are mined and vice versa. There's no need to mine more minerals if you don't need to build more windmills. So I'm hoping industry will uh, stop being in so many silos. And President Hirazuma uh, was telling me about how siloed Japan is, which was very interesting to me because I'm seeing sectors siloed and working together so that collectively we all can get to green. So that concludes my talk. Thank you all for your attention and for coming um, today. And, and uh, I'm going to miss you all tomorrow as we have our um, state scientific awards. So I won't be able to participate tomorrow, but my contact information is here. And I'd love to hear from anybody who'd love to participate together with us in our research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Goodsight. These are matters that are very close to home, uh, where I'm from. Uh, and I think the presentation will make for an interesting discussion uh, after our next presenter, who is uh, Associate Professor Max Oman. Uh, he is a uh, he, he is in the field of environmental and energy system studies at Lund University in the far south of Sweden. Welcome. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. As I said, uh, my name is Max. Uh, I've been working with climate policy and uh, especially heavy industry the past 10 years. and. Uh, uh, the past five years, I've been working with a project called 
hybrid hydrogen uh, steel uh, together with SSAB, LKAB, Vattenfall, and sponsored by the Energy Agency. And I will talk briefly about my views, which is not hybrid views, but it's my views from, as an academic on uh, <clears throat> green steel from renewables, what is happening, what were the causes of this, uh, and will it sort of be exported? Um, uh, we do research in energy system analysis. I do mostly policy analysis, trying to understand the framework conditions for making this kind of technology or solution feasible. So I will begin, yes, by, let's see, yeah. Oh, there, with a brief description of what actually it is. And uh, I don't know, uh, see here, I have my pointer. <clears throat> Spotlight, there. You can see, uh, Steel and steel manufacturing is an extremely energy intensive and also emission intensive uh, <clears throat> production. Uh, in Sweden, 10% of our emission comes from, well, came from two sites, uh, Luleå and Oxelösund. They were basically two blast furnaces emitting quite a lot, 10% uh, of Swedish greenhouse gas emissions. And this is the thing that uh, the steel industry said we need sort of to take it away, it needs to go. And you start with iron ore and you do pellets, and then this is the main cause of all the emissions, the blast furnace, where you layer uh, coke, cooking uh, coal made to coke and uh, uh, iron ore, and where you reduce the iron ore to uh, liquid iron, and then you make steel out of it. So the idea here is uh, there's been a lot of iron, it is what to do with the, the blast furnaces and uh, them as a huge emitter. Uh, and uh, until 2015, 16, I think most of these centered around carbon capture and storage. You're familiar with that technology, basically capturing the CO2 from the fuel gases, uh, cleaning them, compressing them and storing them underground. That would add a substantial cost and energy penalty to the current production systems. Uh, what Hubert did, uh, was instead of opting for another option as a complete shift of the whole system in that sense that instead of uh, using a blast furnace you would use a shaft furnace and you would not use coke the main culprit in this equation but you would use pure hydrogen to reduce the iron ore to what then is called sponge iron uh, and then it could be uh, melted in an electric arc furnace and then become steel this requires huge amount of electricity and in order to be green it, that electricity also has to be green so uh, it is actually a joint venture and this is industrial cooperation uh, which i think is a little bit unique sweden uh, but i've seen it other places as well but at least in the steel industry i haven't seen this kind of cooperation it is between the steel manufacturing ssab the mining factoring uh, in sweden elkaba and also the major utility, power utility, Vattenfall, that would produce the electricity. So far, uh, pilots has been running, it, it tested. Uh, they have produced the first batch of fossil free steel. And they're also planning, or they also right now got funding from the EU Innovation Fund for a full demonstration uh, plant of 1.3 million tons of steel per year. That is very close to a full commercial plant, but it will be a fully integrated uh, plant. Uh, it is set to be finished by 2025, and they would begin selling the first sort of commercial fossil free steel by 2026. <clears throat> this development now, uh, Hubert was the first. Uh, international, I mean, SSRB is a quite small player on the global scene when it comes to steel, but it's, but they're still among sort of the top 20. Uh, the response has been quite overwhelming. And uh, in the last year, uh, I will show one of the uh, last pictures, almost all major steel companies now have plans for going to hydrogen instead of coke and abandoning the blast furnace. Even in Sweden, we actually got competition. Here we got competition from a private company, uh, newly started H2 Green Steel, 
that will basically be neighbor to hybrid uh, and will also produce steel by 2025 or even 2024. They like said the same idea is direct, uh, it's uh, reducing the iron ore with uh, hydrogen, renewable produced hydrogen, and then doing it in an electric arc furnace. So uh, you might take a one or take a step back and thinking of how come that this is actually happening in Sweden and why. Uh, I think we need to look at the resources and the uh, capabilities for this. Sweden has quite unique situation here that we have iron ore, where uh, I think we're the only major uh, iron ore mine in Europe right now. Uh, it's in Elkab, it's in Gällivare and in Kiruna, far up north in Sweden. We have fossil free electricity already. Uh, and at also at a low cost. This is very important at a low cost. Uh, <clears throat> and then we also have, a, to my view, a very competent steel producer. <clears throat> and Rybet is a unique, unique cooperation between them. But the main driver forces for, from a resource uh, perspective, I would say is the very, very uh, uh, low cost of <clears throat> new uh, renewable electricity in Sweden, but also globally. The sort of renewable energy revolution that we're experiencing right now, where renewable energy is decreasing rapidly in cost, has changed the perception of what you could do with electricity. Electricity was before seen as sort of the last resort, high quality energy carrier that you would use uh, <clears throat> for the very, very high quality purposes. Now, at this cost, it actually is becoming a sort of the main workhorse of the economy, or at least it is anticipated to become to replacing oil and coal completely. Uh, and we have a narrative of electrifying industry or electrify everything. Uh, as I said, electricity costs in Sweden, you could produce uh, land-based uh, wind power at 30 euros per megawatt, that's extremely low. We have other places in the world. I think the world record right now is held by Portugal at solar PV at 11 euros per megawatt hour. Uh, so, I mean, it is really, really low uh, in that sense. And that has make suddenly this kind of solution that rests upon large amount of renewable electricity economically feasible. And I would just walk you through some of the <clears throat> economics here. I would just like to show you, this is a curve that shows the marginal abatement cost, basically what it would, what kind of carbon price would be needed uh, for comparing with a traditional steel made out of blast furnaces with a hydrogen. And this is the electricity cost. I mean, our solution will cost more. But actually, it's not that big change anymore. If you look at uh, electricity costs at 40 euros, you would see, depending on how you calculate and uh, how much scrap and so on, somewhere between 40 to 70 euros per mega, uh, per ton of CO2 had to, they had to be valued in order to make it competitive. Uh, then think of this, that actually now we are maybe down from can with power purchase agreement, secure electricity, maybe even down to 30 euros per ton. And then also giving that into account that the EU ETS currently prices CO2 emissions at 70 euros up here. So at this case today, <clears throat> hydrogen direct reduction of steel with renewable energy is actually could be built competitively with blast furnace. So there is actually a very market there. And that is also why we see private sort of H2 green steel also coming into that. And also we see a lot of other companies coming into it. There are some other benefits with this as well. I think we should note uh, that the whole uh, hydrogen direct reduction route offers much greater flexibility when it comes to heat integrating and the way to place the sort of the reduction of iron ore compared to the mining of the ore and also to the steel making. I will come to that conclude, uh, we'll come to that later because it has implications. But also another thing, uh, one thing is looking at resources. 
and phys physical attributes. One is also to look at the politics and good political preconditions has also been a key enabler in this here. Uh, uh, we have developed, we developed a couple of years ago, or one year ago actually, uh, some kind of framework thinking of what is needed for making energy intensive industry actually be able to make the decisions necessary for reaching the Paris climate uh, kind of target. And the first one is of course, directionality. You need to be a certain and trustworthy direction. Zero emissions is the way to go and this is the direction. We have that in Sweden, we have that in the EU. Uh, I would say that in the most of the world, this is actually has been put in place the last two years. So that is good, that is fixed now. Uh, you need cap uh, knowledge creation, you need capacity. We had that in Sweden. I know that also Japan has huge capacity when it comes to steel, but also to other things like Ulkos is a sort of European uh, steel uh, project that went on for a couple of years with uh, also ample finance for uh, research and development and so on. You need the capacity. Uh, we also talked about market creation. You need some kind of niche markets for this green steel. And we always thought when we started this work a couple of years ago that that would have to be politically mandated. The same way we introduced renewable electricity with quotas and so on. Today, actually, development has been quicker than we thought. And there is a huge willingness, private willingness to pay among customers for fossil free steel. Um, they will not have any problem selling it even at a higher price. There is a willingness of uh, car manufacturers, of builders, everyone to use this in order to brand themselves as completely fossil free. Uh, there still might be you know, reasons why we need a political support here. Institutional capacity has also been growing. International coherence, basically uh, the carbon leakage issue. Will, uh, will we outcompete ourselves by producing too expensive steel? That is also uh, being taken care of right now with uh, EU have introduced carbon border adjustments. There was also a trade deal that was made in Glasgow between the EU and the US. Uh, and this is sort of the perception of using trade policy uh, to align it with climate change has changed the past five years as well. And now suddenly it is possible. Uh, we shouldn't also forget actually social acceptance. And you know, if we introduce something new, something old has to go. And here I can see several problems we will face in the future. Blast furnaces are typically embedded in hundred year old cities with very high traditions. And this industrial transformation we're seeing now will have unequal effects across Europe, across the globe. And they will have to sort of have some kind of compensation measure or at least being aware of it. I will not make sure I will not run out of time here. This is sort of, I now try to explain you give a rough of why hydrogen direct production steel from renewable energy has suddenly come in Sweden. And I'll give you a hint that I think it will be exported, but there are some things we need to take care of here as well. One is, of course, it, the climate benefit rests upon the electricity grid being green or being at least perceived as you can buy green steel. Uh, and remember, the biggest sort of steel producing countries are usually also the biggest coal producer. Sweden is an exception in this sense. We have that because we had iron ore and we used to have charcoal long, long, long time ago. But the most, China, India, the two biggest producer, also use a huge amount of coal and even on the power grid. So it hinges upon that we also have a speedy renewable electricity transition. Uh, an alternative here that will come and is already being discussed is to relocate the most energy intensive part of the steel value chain, basically the reduction of iron ore to liquid iron, to relocate that to where you do have potential for very cheap electricity, like the Middle East or Australia, or actually also Scandinavia is also one of those hotspots. So that is also something that is sort of coming up where we see a geographical relocation, new competitive advantages as well. For the case of Japan, I think it's worthwhile for Japan to at least 
try to think of. Japan has a large and very sort of competitive steel industry, but maybe Japan should look at actually importing the most energy intensive step. Like they already export iron ore from Australia. Why not uh, import iron ore from Australia? Why not import actually iron or sponge iron, basically leaving it to the Australians to actually reduce the iron ore to iron instead of having it in Japan. Because I know that Japan has sort of limited potential for renewable energy, even though I think it's actually pretty big. So my last picture, just recapturing. Green steel with hydrogen direct reduction and renewable energy is actually becoming the dominant future option for steel making compliant with the Paris agreements. CCS is still talked about, but the development has completely been stalled the past five years. We need also to reset the market towards green steel. That is already being done on a voluntary basis. A lot of progressive companies are now asking to buy green steel, but we might also need policy encouragement here, either for carbon price or through specific branding or definition that we know the customer will know what is actually green steel or not. Uh, and we also see that you know this will also have trade effects as we have already discussed. Uh, just to highlight, the global development is rapid uh, and it's actually now very rapid. And we have developed a green steel tracker that you might want to check out that actually keeps track on all the announcements the last years of companies going for hydrogen direct reduction or anything else actually commits to produce zero emission steel by 2050. Do we have problems with this? I mean, this sounds all rosy, it is, but I mean, yes, the speed necess necessitated by the Paris Agreement uh, is coming, but the speed in itself is also a problem. Uh, we will have justice concerns when it comes to developing something too quick, too rapidly, when sort of unleashing the market forces is usually never a good way of making it fair and just as well. So we will have problems here, and that will have to be dealt with across the whole value chain, including mining as well. We also have another one critical thing, and that is infrastructure. This requires huge infrastructure development. This is also a very slow process of building infrastructure. And that is also something we're working on it in Sweden, but it's slow. I know in Germany, they're also discussing hydrogen pipelines, power grid. It is also a very, very key issue that still not have been solved yet. And that is also a sort of a necessity in order to make this kind of transition. So thank you for that. I hope that was clear, even though a bit forced. Thank you very much for, again, a very interesting presentation, uh, which is even closer to home for me since I live literally 15 minutes from the steel company and maybe a 30 minutes car drive from the exploitation for H2 Green Steel. Uh, yes, so we are all, not all, but some are looking forward to this development and it uh, sure has caused some social upheaval here in the north and we'll see where where it all where it all ends up uh, now i would like to invite the, the discussant uh, shime kobayashi to introduce the discussion or or initiate the discussion with some remarks sure uh thank you very much for the facilitation professor patterson and uh thank you very much for very insightful presentations from three discussed distinguished speakers. Um, I do have uh, one specific question for Professor Arman, uh, the last speaker. I was interested in how uh, to initiate the discussion. I was interested in how the institutional capacity that have been has been built over 10 years in the, that you mentioned. Um, I just uh, got interested in the, the investors, uh, how the investors uh, involved in the 
uh, building the institutional capacity? When I talk about the institutional capacity in this sense, I actually mean mostly what government agencies do here. And uh, what has changed is that before we started, we asked research funders that are public or also authorities that regulate the industry. And the only thing they knew about heavy industry was energy efficiency, because they've been working with energy efficiency for you know, 50 years before. And so the first question was, who was actually responsible for climate, for this kind of deep production? Energy agency in the beginning, normally responsible for the energy efficiency programs, they said, now this is maybe not really an energy question, this is something else, and so on and so on. And they had no research programs directing to deep reductions like this or anything else. So, <clears throat> When I talk about institutional capacity, is sort of the government awareness of what can be done and how they should be able to regulate it and support it. They actually didn't know. But the way I would think is that actually, you should also be aware of that Battenfall and El Coabe are government owned. They're, private, they're, they're companies, they're operating as companies, but they're government owned. And the SSRB is quite to a large extent owned by the Swedish or the Finnish state. So there's a lot of government interest in the private sector here as well. And that was probably something that also helped them to initiate this. Someone needs to start and there was a good starting point and that also helped kind of the support for all, all of this. And then there are also three strong companies. So I think they've sort of managed to finance them themselves so far with support from government and with support from the EU. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for that. Yeah. I see that uh, Mr. Adiz Zebo has raised his hand. Uh, yes, uh, thanks. I have a question to Max and, and I guess maybe even to you, Maria. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Max. Um, in, in one of your slides towards the end, you mentioned Sweden as a potential um, or Swedish North uh, source for uh, future uh, relocation and an and, and increase of, of kind of green steel production. But how can, how feasible is that really in, in, in terms of, as, also as you mentioned, Maria, that there's been an upheaval and there are things beyond kind of green steel. So there are like large server rooms that are relocating because of cheap renewable energy. There is the battery, uh, enormous battery production facilities. So how, how can everything fit? Yes, I can start by saying that the investments that are planned here in the North and West Bottom, the two regions, uh, are amounting to a thousand billions. So just think about it. It's a lot of money we're talking about. The battery factory is already built. It's not in the same location. I mean, even though people live in the south of Sweden, they tend to look at the north of Sweden as we are all neighbors. It, quite, it is quite some distance between where I sit and where Kiruna and Jelavore are located, uh, where the LKAB have their uh, main uh, production. So uh, there are some distances. We are only three people per square kilometer in this part of Sweden. So there is a lot of space. Uh, that does not mean that it is not crowded every now and then because of the different, vastly different interests in using this land. But having said that, I do think that this development will take place. Uh, the opposition and the, the challenges are related to uh, that we, we have, like you said, Max, that we, we have excess energy, but not so much anymore. So, and there, there is a problem because in Sweden, we cannot develop hydropower. Uh, the keynote speaker talked about how hydropower, which is a very, very important energy source uh, in this development because it has, uh, wind power is intermittent. It needs to be stabilized by hydropower. And we're not gonna build nuclear. So we do look forward to 
some challenge regarding the energy supply, definitely, especially the green energy supply. And like you said, the, it's almost impossible to imagine the size of these uh, facilities, the amount of energy that they require, electrical energy that has to be green for the whole thing to work. And of course, they have to get along with the local people living here. They, there has to be some compromises made. The hybrid test uh, facility was originally planned to be here in Luleå, where I sit, but they, the, the national defense facility the, uh, has sort of come into collision with that. So they had to relocate, which is not unusual. So we'll see. I mean, that was a long answer. I hope it, it at least addressed some of your concerns. I can add to that just to give you some number. I mean, Elko Arbor, the mining company, actually has a long-term strategy to do exactly that. They produce 25 million tons of iron ore, and only five or six of them goes to Sweden. The rest are exported. They have a plan, at least, to reduce it in the mining fields and export it as DRI. Just to give you some numbers of the challenges, Sweden total electricity consumption is around 150 terawatt hours. Hybrid alone will add 15, with also the iron uh, H2B and steel another 10 or 12, with also Elko Abe, it's around 50 terawatt hours. So it's huge expansion, and uh, I agree completely with Maria there. Potentially, it's there, but there would be there, there. It will there will be conflicts because it will also require a lot of land, and uh, land is not sort of land is always difficult. Let me see here if there are some questions uh, from the audience. I, I have a question here for Professor Goodside. I don't know if you have seen it yourself. Uh, the question is, uh, if there is sufficient infrastructure investment in sustainable copper mining in countries like Peru or Zambia, considering what the, the challenge that, challenges that they face in terms of water and electricity shortages, do you think that sustainable mining is an option there? And uh, I also, there is also a question uh, for uh, Mr. Addis Zebo, and that is what kind of institutional capacities exist in the global south for developing sustainable practices in coffee production, like better water and disease management for climate resilient trade management? Are there avenues for knowledge transfer uh, as well in countries, for instance, like Vietnam, who produce a lot of coffee? So uh, I think that those questions are all we have time for. So please, Professor Goodside first, perhaps, and then Mr. Zebo. Sure, I'll keep it brief. And it actually relates to uh, uh, Charlotte Poirier's question um, about reducing risk. And that is mining's happening by multinational companies. The multinational companies are accessing their finances from uh, investors from around the world. So um, the sustainable mining that's going on, I don't think is good enough yet anywhere. Um, I think that uh, we have to remember that the impact on the environment is not coming so much from the mining itself or digging the ore up. It's coming from processing the ore, the amount of water and electricity used and the labor costs associated with that then the costs associated in what's called stage three emissions, getting it to market. So um, the stage one emissions for mining are actually very low. I think um, it should be prioritized, uh, but I think that um, uh, the efforts should probably be focused in areas that are mining first with the capacity to actually deploy technologies and, and pilot scale studies to, uh, to do mining and processing operations through electrification, through using other fuel sources such as hydrogen and, um, and uh, uh, 
new models of, of um, low energy, low water processing, and then deploy them to mines around the world with the capacity building that that will bring with it. Thank you. Okay, then I'll take it. Thank you uh, for the question. So in terms of institutional capacities that, that exist in the global south uh, for developing the sustainable practices, there, there are a lot of them. And there are a lot of that are uh, both kind of locally driven, such as uh, research in drought resistant crops, for example, in Brazil is, is, is a major topic. There are also international development uh, initi initiatives and public-private partnerships, such as Coffee and Climate Initiative, and, and also large, uh, large actors uh, who are large uh, traders and, and roasters have uh, work on sustainable practices with their own farmers. But usually the main, main problem with uh, implementing sustainable practices is that it lowers the yield. And since almost 75% of the world's coffee producers are uh, smallholder farmers who so have low, less than five hectares production. A anything that lowers the yield means uh, lower income. And up until a couple of months ago, there was a huge problem because the prices were very low. Now, the prices have actually exploded upwards, partly due to uh, transboundary uh, climate risks. So, which means that some producers manage to get more, more money for the coffee, but others, who have lost their yield uh, are, are going bankrupt. And, and, and yesterday, for example, I read in Ethiopia that there are farmers, even if uh, coffee price has increased, uh, they are, since they are kind of locked into futures contracts, they, they are ne nevertheless going bankrupt because they cannot uh, deliver as much product as, as uh, they have uh, signed up to. So there are, M many issues are, 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 are problematic. And also another uh, practice would be to increase to higher latitudes, but uh, one major issue with that would be that it would increase deforestation and, and create even kind of a, a, a feedback uh, uh, effect on, on creating more future climate change. Thank you very much. Uh, the wrap up will be made by uh, Mahima Dugai, please, I turn to you. Thank you, Professor Peterson. Uh, and with this, uh, we now come to an end of day one of the symposium. First of all, I would like to thank our fantastic speakers for their thought-provoking and remarkable presentations, our discussants for their insightful comments, and our chairs for their expert guidance of the discussions, and the audience as well, of course, for their time. We began today with a keynote speech on hydropower, which contributes 16% to the world's total electricity generated and 70% of renewable electricity generated. Professor Ashok Swain talked about how, while hydropower can certainly help reduce dependence on fossil fuel-based energy, it also faces several challenges like climate-induced changing rainfall and snow melting patterns and substantial environmental, social, and economic costs. Next, Mr. Jeremy Maxey discussed the geopolitics of renewable energy in context of the protracted US-China strategic rivalry to command the global economy, and how this has created a strategic opportunity for Sweden and Japan in particular to work together to facilitate global cooperation. Professor Dhanashree Jayaram further situated the discussion in context of the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy highlighting how Japan and Sweden can capitalize on their technological expertise and capacities in the renewable sector to initiate broader cooperation between Europe and the Indo-Pacific region. Mr. Ashish Basu then detailed how the different forms of renewable energy could be effectively used across continents based on his own extensive expertise in the field. In the second session, we focused on Sweden's experience with renewable energy Dr. Cecilia Higa talked about Sweden's leading role in decarbonization and the policy instruments that have helped Stockholm promote biofuels, particularly in the transport sector, which can now be a model for other countries to follow. Professor Maria Pettersson discussed the legal framework surrounding wind power development in Sweden, including undertaking envi environmentally hazardous activities like wind power installations and issues of land use. Dr. Bengtstrid 
proposed agrivoltaics, um, that is the dub double use of land for agriculture and solar parks as a way of meeting the future energy needs of the country. In our last and final session, we shifted focus to green growth and the private sector with Dr. Adiz Zebo launching the discussion with a presentation highlighting the need for uh, private public cooperation to manage and um, transboundary climate risks and build more resilient supply chains. Uh, Professor Michael Goodside detailed the sustainable uh, copper paradox facing the mining industry and explored how we can increase copper production, which is essential for transition to a green energy society without harming the environment. And lastly, of course, we ended with Professor Max Armand's uh, presentation on physical and policy preconditions for green steel, that is the development of steel from renewable hydrogen and its future implications on industry. Yeah. A key common thread in all these presentations remain the need for collaborative global approaches to foster further development of climate solutions and take forward climate action. We will reconvene again tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central European time or 5 p.m. Japan Standard Time to focus on climate cooperation and the role of institutions on the international stage and the debates in Sweden and Japan. You can find uh, the program for this uh, in your emails or on ISTP's website. We will also hold a panel discussion to discuss the way forward. Thank you again for your time today and do join us again tomorrow.